Okay. I think we are live. That seems to be seems to be live now, which is great. The start of every good stream with uh, starting with making sure the stream is working. Uh, oops, somebody's watching. I wonder if that's me. <laughs> I can't tell. If it's not me, hello out there, whoever you are. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Let me see if I can uh, put the chat window somewhere more useful for me so I can actually see it. Let's try that. Alrighty. Well, let's jump right into it. So tonight's project is uh, trying to um, make a 3D printed case for uh, a PCB-based project that I've been working on. Um, which is uh, a 50 watt amplifier project for uh, 14 megahertz or 7 megahertz. So uh, let's just take a look here. So just to give you an idea of it, let me see if I can actually show you the project as it currently exists. Um, let me pop over here. Try that. Yeah, look at that. All right. So janky stream setup. I apologize. Um, I've been trying to get my phone which is just off the side of me here set up as a streaming source and it's been very grumpy um but what it's doing currently is using a little app i think it's called ip camera um streaming to chrome on the laptop in front of me and then uh the streaming software is using just a window in chrome and is streaming that out as part of the stream so janky but but it works you see and the latency is not too bad um, compared to what is live, so I think it should be just fine. So in any case, this is the project that I'm going to be working on a case for, and this is Rev 1 of the project, um, so there will be Rev 2 and 3 and 4, but I should be able to come up with at least a bare-bones case um, for this that should fit future revisions. Um, so if you want to know more about this project, you can actually go um, to either my blog, which is kk9jef.wordpress.com, uh, or you can... Um, go to my YouTube account, which is the streaming on right now, uh, which is KK9JEF on YouTube. Um, but in any case, um, you can check out the technical details there. Basically, this is a 50-watt um, a output amplifier that's meant for amplifying um, radio frequencies in some frequency bands of interest. Specifically, I'm thinking of it for 7 megahertz and 14 megahertz, um, but really could be anywhere in the amateur bands. You actually will see just down here, uh, there's a, a plug-in spot for a low-pass filter. Um, so the idea is this would be for a single band of interest, and then when you wanted to change bands, you have to pop the case open, uh, replace the filter, uh, close it back up, and, and begin operating again. Um, let's see. Let, before we dive into that real quick, let me just uh, see, make sure this is actually showing up on the interwebs. Ooh, well, at least people are watching. At least my stream health is bad. I don't know how to fix that. Not a, not not uh, not savvy enough to be able to help with that at all. Um, but I can at least change the title so people know what they're looking at. Um, we'll call this. Well, maybe I can't anymore. We'll call this a three D printing uh, for PCB projects live stream okay um if anyone's out there in the universe and really are watching it says my stream health is very poor so i'm not sure why why that would be but let me know if you can uh how things are turning up i hope they're all right uh well we'll, we'll find out um all right so let me dive in here oh um, let me, this whole time I've been talking at you like you can see what's happening. Let's, there we go. So this is what I was <laughs> describing earlier that I guess you couldn't actually see because I'm still learning how OBS works. This is this janky streaming Chrome window. Um, so when I, so when I said earlier, like you could plug in a low pass filter here and I was waving my hands about, so you couldn't actually see any of that. So let me try that again. So you can see just down there, uh, the low pass filter plug-in section. So you'd put little female headers just there, uh, and then you have a plug-in filter module. And actually, I have a sample of what that might look like. 
So this is a uh, filter from a place called QRP Labs, QRP la QRP-Labs.com. So it's just a little PCB filter board um, that the owner of QRP Labs, Hans Summers, uses for all of his products for bandpass filters and low-pass filters. So I figured I would use the same form factor for my filters. Now, his are meant for like five or 10 watts, and I'm thinking this is a more like a 50 watt output project, so it wouldn't necessarily be that you would use the same filter for both, just that the form factor is the same. Like if we're gonna standardize on this form factor for filters, then if you built a filter for this project, you could also use it for a QRP project, a low power project, right? Um, all right, let's see. It's still saying my stream health is bad. Use a keyframe frequency of four seconds or less. Oh, hmm, hmm. I, uh, like I say, I don't know how to help that. Last time I streamed with these exact same settings, everything seemed fine. So I guess I'm just gonna plow ahead and, uh, and we'll see how we do. Video bitrate is 2500 sex, uh, X, it's H264 as a, a software encoder, that should be fine. It should be fine, I would think. Hmm. All right, well, let's see. All right, well, let's just plow ahead and uh, it, hopefully something happens. Um, so let's fade back here. Let's go back to Fusion. So the bulk of this evening is going to be focused on making the case in Fusion 360, which is my 3D design software of choice for projects like this. Um, but I am also going to be seeing if I can figure out how to get uh, Eagle to cooperate. So this is Eagle 9.1. Um, and I, fair caveat, I've recently upgraded from my old version of Eagle, which was, I was still running 6.6. .6, so not everything has translated properly. Like a couple of my um, libraries have not come over, which is a little upsetting. Um, like the libraries that I built specifically with parts for this kind of project. But um, we're just gonna give it a try. And at least the board and the Gerbers should be there. So I don't know that I actually will need to do any schematic editing or board editing for this. I should be able to just port the board in um, to Fusion in theory. So I'm gonna open up my QRP amp board file there. Yeah, so this is this is Eagle, um, which you may have seen before in my streams. This it looks a little different than the last time I streamed. This is Eagle 9.1.0. I know there's a 9.1.3. I didn't install before the stream, apologies. Um, so this is the board uh, that we're gonna be laying out this evening. So you can see, if you look at, let's get the orientation right. If you look at that, Look at this board layout in relation to the actual PCB. You can see the resemblance, right? We've got our uh, our big uh, output transformer down at the bottom here. These middle sections I actually had to manually cut out using uh, a drill, a drill bit, and a nibbler um, because I didn't do the cutouts right, or JLC PCB didn't document them correctly, which they didn't. But it's fine. Um, but the sort of critical features on this, you can see I have three mounting holes um, placed, placed a little bit arbitrarily, right? I've got one in the corner here, one in the corner here, and I've actually got one that's really snugged up next to this relay, which I'm not super duper happy about, um, considering how big that really is. So that is gonna have to move. So that, that thought that I'm gonna move that hole later is actually gonna drive a little bit of how I'm gonna design this case later in Fusion, because I wanna be sure that when I move that hole, um, and the mounting point associated to it that all of the other geometry that I've built on top of it updates automatically, right? I don't want to build myself into a corner in some way um, that I would have to go back and manually delete a bunch of things and add a bunch of new features. I just want to be able to say, I want my mounting point here. Please put you know, my boss or my, my standoff in the right place. Yeah, so let's head back to here. I'll take a look at Eagle. So... Now this, I will totally be, this is the first time I am trying this on stream. So I'm not 100% sure it's gonna go great. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's my first time trying this at all. Um, but one of the features they introduced with Eagle 8.1, um, what when, which is around the time that Autodesk acquired Eagle, which used to be sort of um, just like one step more commercial than KiCad. Like KiCad has always been like open source, free as in beer, free as in speech. 
Um, and Eagle has always been like, here's a free version for the hobbyists, and we'd like it if you bought our product to, to, uh, to do your professional work with. And now Autodesk, um, who makes AutoCAD and Fusion 360 and a bunch of other sort of manufacturing-based CAD products, now owns Eagle and runs Eagle. Um, so one of the features they built in to 8.1, I think, 8.3, is this ability to, in theory, just use your Eagle models, um, your Eagle boards in Fusion. Um, so I'm just taking a quick peek and making sure I remember exactly how this is done. Um, the board editor for interface, like the fusion sync button to uh, the board editor, if the fusion sync button, oh man, we get a whole fusion sync button now. Let's see what the, where the heck does that live? Fusion sync design link. Design link? No, that's like for bombs. PCB quote is not what I want. Uh, da, da, da. Fusion pull. This is not quite. Not quite going well. Maybe be the fusion sync, which is what I would like to do. So I have fusion running, and I have eagle running. So how do I do a sync between them? The documentation just says use the fusion sync button, but I don't see a big fusion sync button. So that's not super great, is it? Huh. Um, well, in the meantime, let me see. I've opened a board, and the board editor interface says a fusion sync button. That's all it says. That's really all it says. Let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. Design manager. I'm still getting very much used to the new, I guess it's new to me. It's mildly, oh, fusion sync. There we go. Fusion sync. Sync your PC via fusion. Streamline your workflow. Can a manical mod and link between your eagle and All right. Uh, create new fusion design. Okay. Uh, create a location. Glass Jeffrey. Yeah, that's me. Um, uh, it's not going to let me create a folder here, is it? Okay. So maybe I need to do this in Fusion first. So if I go back into Fusion. Um, all right. Let me. Can see a little bit. Let me create a new project. Uh, we'll call this QRP Amplifier. Hopefully that syncs. The one thing, so Fusion, for those of you who may not have used it before, it has this always online model where you are, um, any change you make is pretty much instantly auto saved to the cloud. I mean, you can, when you hit save, it'll version it and then save it. But a lot of your work is preserved digitally online, um, which is great um, in that if I have a design on this computer, um, and I, you know, want to work on another computer, I want to share it with somebody else, all that sort of digital backend is built in. It's not quite to the same extreme as something like Onshape, which is literally in your web browser, but it is very much, you know, your design lives in the cloud, as far as I can tell. Um, I don't know if you had like a, an industrial license of this, if there would be an option for not doing that. Um, and it's not like it's publicly accessible, right? It's just digitally attached to my Autodesk login so my glass dot jeffrey uh, up here is my account so so that's linked to my fusion project so i've got my new project up here um, called qrp amplifier let's see here let's see if this works so we'll go back to eagle um we will hit our fusion sync create new fusion design Source it found again, and it found so that glass. Jeffrey is a really good sign because that is my um, my Autodesk account. Oh, good, it's found my QRP amplifier project. Maybe if you just like okay, great. Push to fusion. Ah, so this is something it doesn't have um, three dimensional packages for any of the parts on here. So if you did, apparently, it would, um, if I I don't know how I can, if I can create models for these or if I need to provide models for them, but it will do the 3D modeling of all of the components in Fusion, which is pretty snazzy. Um, 
but I don't have any of that. I really just want the PCB because I can do all the sort of like dimensional modeling by hand. That's fine. Um, so now we've got push diffusion, which is a good sign. Let's see here. Let that do its thing. This may take several minutes. You may hide this window. That's all right. Um, I may hide that window. I might not. Um, okay. See if uh, fusion is doing anything. Mm, no visible signs of life. Pushing eagle design to fusion. All right. Well, oh. Oh, I've got a pop-up over here. Your eagle has been as soon as you push to fusion. Reset to edit your PCB. Ensure the PCB feature box is checked and fusion preferences under preview. All right. Last edited view source view on what pull from fusion, push to fusion. This is an eagle window, by the way. I've got fusion in the background, but this is an eagle window. Interesting. Okay. Great. Let's close that. Let's see. If I open my QRP. Oh, so this is new. QRP AMP 1. All right. Let's pull that open. And we'll see, oops, please launch Fusion 360. It needs the latest update. Oh, okay. Well, working on Windows, everything needs an update. If we're lucky, it won't need a reboot of the whole computer. It will be great. Um, well, so now we can watch the exciting process of watching software update in real time. So in the meantime, um, we can take a quick look um, at uh, this PCB layout itself. So, uh, Actually, you know what? I'll tell you what. If you give me just one second, I am going to post a quick link to this live stream um, on social media because I said I would do it, and now I am. Um, those of you who are already watching have found it from social media, I imagine. Um, or maybe you're subscribers on YouTube, which is great for all. Um, uh, but uh, just in case anyone else wants to come and join us, let me do a little quick social media update. Do, do, do. All right, we'll put that out there. Fusion looks like it's still spinning its wheels, so this is actually going to time out pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. And do the tweet. To Eagle Diffusion, PCB Project. Tweet, tweet. In this world of social media. Okay, so let's see here. I really just want to make sure that Fusion is, is really launching. Oh, yes, I have uh, a Fusion startup window on my alternate monitor over here, which is a very good sign. Um, but that's going to take a few minutes to launch, so I guess, um, why don't we take a real quick look. So, for those who haven't seen um, the previous stream, which was uh, the schematic for this board, all it basically is, is I've got um, a radio, an RF signal coming in here um, from a transmitter. It goes through this bypass relay, and if there's no power provided to this thing, then the signal is going to come right through this relay, out the other relay, and out to the output. No amplification. If I have power, this part of the PCB is a little RF sensing circuit, so that will switch. Uh, when it sees RF, it'll switch the relays both on. That'll send signal through this section of resistors, which is just a little 3 dB pad, but I didn't have enough high power resistors to do the actual padding from 5 watts down to like 2 watts, so this gives you the option to do a bunch of like half watt resistors in parallel. Um, the signal then goes through um, this ballon essentially um, to the two power transistors here, which are IRF 510s. Um, these are the uh, bias pots for adjusting the bias on both of those signal pins. Um, we go through this choke, um, well, not through, but this is the choke that provides power. We go through our output transformer, and we'll go through our low pass filter out the relay and out to the output. So with um, 13 volts or so on the drains of these two FETs, we get about 15 watts out. With 26, 27 volts, we get about 50 watts out. Um, so there's an option over here. I've only populated one of them, um, but you can do a single set of power poles in to provide you know, your 13.2 volts from a single SLA source. Um, or you can throw this switch and have a second set of power poles here if you wanted to have two you know, SLA type sources in parallel. Um, and this allows you to sort of switch between them on the fly.
Um, so that's the quick and dirty version of what the circuit is that we'll be working with tonight. Um, let me see over here. Is Fusion still uploading? Oh, Fusion takes just an age. Just an age to launch. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Well, while Fusion is launching, let me fade you back over here. Um, let's have a look at that board again. So this is the layout in Eagle. And you might have um, noticed on this board, so I have, here, I'm gonna show you again. We have this cutout in the middle of the board. Ooh, if we lost our, if we lost our live stream, oh no. Let's see, there we go. Oh, how strange. Uh, oh, I know what it is. I had the streaming window minimized. Um, and when it was minimized, it wasn't updating. Well, that's just what I get for using a Kluge streaming solution. Okay, so I have um, this hole in the middle of the PCB here um, with the idea that the two power FETs um, are going to get bent over like this, and then you'd put a, piece, uh, a heat sink underneath the PCB, um, and you would bolt to it there. And that would allow you to use basically any heat sink that has at least that much area. Um, you know, so you wouldn't be bound to a specific like dimensional heat sink. Cause I don't, I have a bunch of heat sinks laying around from ham fests and from old computer projects um, that just have, you know, a square pad or a rectangular pad. You find them on the flea market for a dollar. Um, and that seems kind of perfect for this kind of like, I want to rev through many of these amplifiers. Um, so unfortunately um, the PCBs arrived from JLC PCB like this without the cutout in them. Um, so I've been talking to some folks on the ham radio forums about way, better ways to indicate that something should be cut out. Um, I basically just indicated in the uh, outline section of my board that it should be like that. Uh, here, let me show you. So in this section of the board, just in here, um, this black line is part of the outline layer. And I meant that to indicate, like, please cut this. And I did um, copper keep out so we weren't getting um, any copper fill in there. And that seems to have worked, right? Like, if we go back to the PCB for a second, you can sort of see there's a different coloring to the section where those FETs are going to chop through. So there's no ground plane. There's no copper in there. Um, but they obviously didn't cut it out. So in revision two, I'm going to have to do something to help, like, clarify that, um, that that should be actually cut out. Um, all righty, let's see. Oh, Fusion ooh, seems to be coming online. Come on, Fusion. You can do it. Yeah, there we go. Oh, ooh, we're chug-a-lugging a little bit there. Why don't we give that just a couple more minutes to do its thing? Um, so, so like I say, this board is going to get a revision two at some point. And one of the things that's becoming pretty obvious is I need, I need to move this hole right here. Um, cause it's just, you know, it, on, on paper, it looks pretty far from this relay. Um, but in actuality, when it, you know, once I populated that part, you can see like just how close the, uh, let's get some light in there. You know, it's like, I can get a screw in there. That's not a problem, but just for like ease of assembly, it'd be nice to have even like another eighth of an inch or so. Um, so on revision two, that's definitely going to have to be. Um, in the cards. All right, Fusion, you gonna play nice? Uh, let's try. Oh, Fusion, you're just so grumpy. You're just so grumpy. All right. Sorry to do this. Let's try this one more time. Let's close that up. I'll try relaunching. We'll see what happens. Uh, all right, well, in the meantime, I want to take a little closer look into this fusion sync window here because it's kind of interesting um so looks like edit source view on web it looks like if i made changes i could pull them from fusion or push my current board changes to it the view on web is kind of interesting let's see if that does all right well it's asking me to log into my autodesk account on the website so i'm not going to show you that on stream i'm going to do that just over on the other monitor here because you don't need my email or password. Fusion. Uh, wow, this is swanky. 
No kidding. All right, so this is, I just logged in, and this is what it opened up. QRP AMP 1 V1 Fusion Design Shared Link Off. Interesting. Last week, nine minutes ago, uses, used in, and drawings. I might be behind the times. Is this available for all of my Fusion Designs? Maybe, so this is, I haven't really looked into, like, the sort of online sharing options um, for Fusion because I mostly just work on designs by myself. Um, but good golly me, look at this is, yeah, this is all of the designs. There's all my, the wireless dimmer model, the boost converter, gear assembly. Yeah, this is all of it. Rack City. Um, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, neat. Well, for those of you who just joined us, um, hello. Um, we are working on designing a 3D printed case for a PCB project I've been working on. Um, specifically this one. Um, so this is a little 50 watt amplifier project I've been working on um, that is coming to completion. Uh, it's uh, tested and, and essentially working. I need to do a little bit more work down here and populate this. Um, but I've decided it's time to at least build the first box. Um, I'd like to have uh, a 3D printable box because I ordered a bunch of these from China, from JLC PCB, and their minimum order quantity is 10 or 10. Um, I say 10 in quotes because I got nine, um, but for $2 a piece, shipping included, you can't beat that price. Um, so they show up just like that. Oh, I have a, a better way of doing this. They show up just like that. Um, and uh, you solder all the components on and uh, get yourself a little amplifier. So now I'd like a box. Um, and this box, I think, is going to be in three parts. Uh, it's going to be sort of the bottom of the box, which is going to encapsulate um, underneath here. Uh, and have mounting posts for the three holes. Uh, that will have a lid, which will screw on. I'm thinking it's going to use some knurled inserts, which are a little brass piece that you heat up and actually melt into the plastic. Um, and then, so uh, as I was describing a moment ago, and I, I see there's a few more, um, a few more people who joined us recently, um, there, these FETs are designed to stick down through the bottom of the PCB and attach to a heat sink. Um, and so what I think I'm going to do is have the, the sort of bottom case of the box um, have essentially this cut out in it. Um, and the bottom, the bottom would have um, mounting posts to the bottom of this um, so that you could uh, essentially mount your heatsink external to the bottom of the box. And I haven't figured out how exactly I want to work. I want to make that work yet. Um, like I could have the sort of bottom have some little standoff posts and you could be gluing your heat sink to it. I kind of want to stay away from like requiring myself to tap aluminum every time I build one of these, even though that would be sort of more ideal. Um, I'm imagining a somewhat more mechanical solution. Um, oh, cool. Aaron's on. Hi, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Laudermuth, who's a super cool TD in town, says, Chris and I shared online super work on projects together. Yeah, that makes total sense. Aaron and, uh, uh, and Chris's designs actually got featured at USITT this year, which was super cool. Um, some prop work they had done, and he and uh, Peter Anderson um, up at Northwestern do some super cool things. Kenneth Fingen says, nominally 10 copies. Yeah, it's like, I got nine, somebody might get 11, but like literally it was, you know, 10 copies for, you know, $18 shipped DHL. So I ordered on a Wednesday and they showed up on a Tuesday um, for anything up to, I want to say 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, um, dual layer, uh, one ounce copper green. Although I think you, I don't know that they charge you for additional colors. Um, I remember there was additional color option that I didn't take, but um, but for like a bare bones PCB project, like you you can't beat that price. Okay. All of this was really just Phil, because I'm trying to get Fusion to boot. Um, we're exploring the new the new Fusion Sync feature. Um, so let's see. Fusion is sort of quietly booting in the background as my computer chugs along. Um, let's see here. What else is there to say about this PCB in the meantime? Um, yeah, so I struggled for a long time on this, this FET mounting solution in the middle here um, because... Like essentially the options were have the FETs hang down through the middle of the board, which is what I've done here. And that's what a lot of the really inexpensive QRP style amplifiers um, 
will do. You know, they have a, a cutout in them, uh, and then you mount them down to a heat sink that you provide or they provide. And so that's sort of what drew me to this. Um, I looked at trying to do like a FETS mounted on the edge of the board, sort of like old school audio amplifier style, and then you put your heat sink off the back of your enclosure. And I liked that. The only thing I didn't really love about it is um, I think it, that would be more constraining as far as your choice of heat sinks. Like with the with the design here, like you literally could use a CPU heat sink because um, you're really only covering like a square inch. Whereas hanging out the back, you have a, a few fewer choices of um, what your your sort of interface layer could be. Let's see if Fusion is playing nice. Hey, there we go. All right, so let's open QRP amp. Kenneth Finnegan says, I understand those houses run 11 to 12 panels with your design on it, and then ship you the ones that pass QC, so sometimes you get 11 to 12 copies. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, for a very bare bones, quick turn process, like, I can't complain. Like, obviously, anything that you'd want in, you know, an exact quantity, you're not using this kind of prototyping service. Although, from my understanding, JLC PCB bills himself as, like, an enormous fab house, so maybe you would do a production with them, but for this sort of hobbyist level, you know, I want roughly 10. I mean, really, like, I've, I populated one. I did some, here, I'll show you. I've, I've used exactly three of these things. I populated one. This was my demo board to make sure I could do the cutouts, because like I said, the cutouts didn't turn out how I intended. And then, you know, I've been using other ones as sort of scrap. Like, I'm not ever going to populate all 10 of these, so having nine is, like, not the end of the world. Uh... Ken says, lol, CPU heatsink plus very careful place in the spacers or insulation for all those other through-hole components. Yeah, it's true. Like, there's definitely... So, I'm not sure if you were in the room, Kenneth. So, the idea is that the box that we're designing today, this is the whole theory of this stream, um, is that the, the case, which is the underside of this, only has a cutout in this same PCB profile. Um, now, I am going to have to think a little bit about, like, what is the clearance between the bottom of this PCB and the bottom of that box to make that... You know, so that I can still get all my little through-hole tabby dues, not get crushed. But my, in theory, my interface between the PCB and the the heat sink is only in this same footprint. Um, and also, like this this fed is not bent down nearly as much as I as I would like. I got a little bit scared and stops nibbling away a little early, um, and that sort of limited how far those fets can go down through the hole. So I think I'm probably gonna have to do some rework on that at some point. Um, okay, so let's take a look at Fusion here. So this is the PCB that we slurped in, right? And as we saw earlier, I don't have 3D models for any of this. So it's just sort of populated it with... I am, I'm kind of impressed it knows... I mean, I, I imagine this data just comes out of Eagle. Like, it has this sort of generic footprint of each part. Um, and it has pad placement, that's pretty good yeah that's pretty good so like that will that will definitely get us through um you know so all of the considerations for the height of the components and the clearance on the underside like that's all gonna have to be uh on me and is not something that i can let fusion drive um uh but you know this is a pretty good place to start ken says also go populate the fet from the bottom of the board <laughs> yeah that's actually that's a much that's a much better idea so, yeah, I could, instead of taking the leads up from the top and bending them down through the hole, I could, <laughs> that's right, I could have just populated from the bottom and then just bent them over to sort of be in the right configuration. Yeah, well, there you go. That's why you do these streams. You learn something. Uh, but that's not going to affect my, at least as the current thought of the idea, that shouldn't affect this box project too much. Um, so before... Um, before we get too far in, um, let me, so I'm, like I said, I'm thinking of this as a three component design. So I'm gonna start by creating those components. Um, inside of Fusion 360, you pretty much always want to be working inside of a component um, because there are many things you can change in Fusion 360 within the timeline, but the presence of your verbs, your actions that show up on the timeline down here, your presence, oh, I'm not even showing you. Here we go. The presence of your verbs within the timeline is not something you can place into a component after you've done it. Um, let's see a few things in chat. 
Looks like the marking in the courtyard mechanical lacking 3D model. Courtyard is a general mechanical clearance outline. Aaron says, stupid question, why can't they put a hole in the board for you? They should be able to. I think what's probably happened is I am not marking it up in the way that they expect. Um, the documentation for this process from JLC is not great. Um, uh, like there's, it, there is some like we can do, you know, down to six mil holes and we can do this minimum trace, but it's not, it's not super great about specifics like that. Um, so, and I also, to be fair, I didn't lay it out in what I think is a more standard way. So like, let's take a look here. Yeah. So what I did is basically add a rectangle on the out, the board outline layer, um, that sort of defines that hole and define it as a keep out. I did define it on a copper layer to like, so please don't pour any copper in here so I'm not accidentally like cutting through a ground plane. And that seems to have happened. Um, I've seen suggestions since I got these PCBs of people actually putting a big fat label across the top that says cut out, um, you know, so it's extra clear. It also might be that GLC just doesn't do it um, for their like bargain basement prices. Um, and that would be fine. It's just like the documentation is kind of, it's kind of sketchy. Um, all right, so let's see, uh, let me, oh man, it's been a minute here. Let's rename this. We'll call this box bottom. We'll make another component called box top. And, um, I think there is a non-zero chance we're going to need a third component that is going to be the interface layer between our box and the heat sink. Part of me is toying with the idea that um, the bottom of the box would have some kind of standardized mounting holes, and then you would print a mount that would basically be an adapter between the box itself and your heat sink. I don't know if that's going to be necessary. And obviously, I'm still thinking through this design as we're drafting tonight. Um, but um, let's make a component for it anyway. Let's pop over here. Um, so, all right. So for those who are new to Fusion, I don't know if any of you are, but in case you are, um, you can see all the actions we've taken so far um, have populated themselves in the timeline. So my original component creation, uh, the importing of the PCB, which has this cool little PCB symbol that I haven't seen before, and then the creation of the three components. And I'm going to really try and be good about keeping my actions inside of a component, because I didn't do that on my mini moving light project, and it's just it's just a mess. Um, I mean, it's I don't know that it's, it was preventable, because there's you know hundreds and hundreds of actions in there, but it, I wish it was a little bit cleaner. Um, so let's start with... The box bottom, and I think where I actually want to start is by, let's see, so that's the front, so that's the bottom, yeah. So I'm going to start by defining a few parameters, because I think I'm going to want to be able to change a few of these critical dimensions easily later. Well, this is interesting, so we've got model parameters that it sucked in from the PCB itself. That's kind of cool. Wow, look at this board a long distance taper angle and then these are parameters for every individual part that's on the board or every um i guess every part model that's on the board a long distance and taper angle well someday we're gonna have to come back and futz with those a long distance 0.1 millimeter and zero degree taper angle huh all right well in any case i'm going to make a couple of parameters um I think I'm not going to go crazy parameterizing the whole model because you, you I mean, it would be, you could go and say like, you know, I need a parameter that represents the distance between, you know, the coax side of my PCB and the front of the box and the power side of the PCB and the end of the box and left, you know, you could make everything a parameter, but at that point for that kind of one-off dimension, you might as well just use a dimension. Um, I'm more thinking that these are going to be sort of the seminal things that I probably am going to want to change and adjust as I go through revisions. And putting them in a parameter is just going to make it easier for me to find those dimensions later. I'm also going to make a parameter for a few of the mechanical details um, that I uh, am going to reuse over the course of the design. So I think the first um, parameter that I'm going to create is going to be the distance between uh, the bottom plane of the PCB itself 
and the bottom solid surface of the box. Um, and we're going to call that PCB to bottom millimeters. Uh, we will give that a value to start with of, oh, I don't know, 1.5 millimeters. Great. Um, we are going to make a parameter for, um, so like I said, so I'm going to, I think, make this box, which has, will have little standoffs coming up from the bottom of the box to meet up with these holes. Uh, and then we're going to do knurled inserts going into them. Um, so for uh, an M3 screw, uh, my standard hole size in PLA for a three millimeter threaded uh, a knurled insert is 3.4 millimeters in diameter. So I'm going to call that neural hole. Oh, you can't see this. Neural hole diameter, uh, which is 3.4 millimeters. Um, and that will be pretty much constant. Um, I guess I'm also going to make a uh, dimension called neural standoff width, which will be, uh, let's call that diameter. Width is uh, one of those terms um, that has uh, so many different meanings, like everything can be a width. So I'm going to try and be good about not saying width. In, especially in these parameters. So I'm actually going to make this um, neural hole, neural hole diameter plus, I don't know, let's do two millimeters. That's a little excessive, but um, that'll make it a nice beefy standoff. Um, and actually, you know what? I'm going to come up here and because I'm anticipating I'm going to print this thing in either 0.2 or 0.3 millimeter layer heights, I'm going to do this as 1.8 millimeters um, from the bottom of the, of the box to the PCB. We may come back and futz with that later as we sort of measure what these little, um, oh man, what these little uh, bogey bits are on the bottom of the board and how tall they actually need to be. Okay, so um, let us, uh, I guess let's just get started. Um, I'll tell you what, let me, so we're in our box bottom. Let me make sure. So that's going to be our top of our PCB, yeah. So I think what I would actually like to do is rotate it. So I, I can see you think of this, this surface looking down on the PCB as the top. So I'm actually gonna rotate my PCB in Fusion to make that true, because right now you can tell by the orientation cube it's the front. And I think that's just not going to serve me well. So we'll just do a move copy. Yep. Uh, we'll do, what would you be, a Z angle move? Not that. <laughs> uh, you would be. Nope. You would be X angle move. I guess you'd be minus 90. All right. So now top of our PCB should be there. Yeah. OK, great. Great. OK, so now that's our top. And this can be, this is more on that what I'm thinking of. Okay, so we'll go into our box bottom. Um, I am going to start by defining, oops, some components have been moved. Oh yeah, capture, capture, capture. Great. So that, so it was just telling me that I had done a, a move, but I hadn't actually captured the position which inserts that into your timeline. Let's just double check it saved it. Where did that capture go? Nowhere. Interesting. I wonder if it's because I haven't had any other actions in that component yet. It's weird. Um, so we'll start with, yes, capture, capture. Um, we'll do an offset plane from the bottom of our PCB uh, and we'll go uh, PCB to bottom millimeters down. Great. And that's where we'll do our sketch it's on that layer. Okay, so now I'm sketching on a plane that is currently one and a half millimeters below the bottom of our PCB, um, which is exactly where I want it to be. So we will, oops, I don't need another sketch. That's a little excessive. What I need is a rectangle. Okay. Um, so I am also going to try and be really good about minimizing the number of features that I'm putting into each sketch and about naming my sketches, which I never do. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. 
Um, so now it's just kind of getting into the aesthetics of what this actual size of this box is going to be. Um, and so to help me think about that, I'll take a look at this actual PCB here. So I would really, the length of these wires and the, the um, power pole wiring is, is arbitrary. Um, but it does, it's not entirely unreasonable. Like these could easily be shortened up, but this is not, not far from what it would actually want to be. So I'm just thinking about how far is the rear of this box going to be from this section. Um, so I'm just going to real roughly um, pencil in what I think that dimension should be for workability's sake. I'm just going to like hold my calipers up and say that's, I don't know, that's about an inch. That's a little much. That's about 15 millimeters. 20 millimeters. If I was being quite clever, I would go back and model like the power poles into this, and I might still actually. Um, but just to get us started, let's let's lay in some dimensions. So let's say, uh, let's see. I don't need another rectangle. No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. Um, what I need is dimension, dimension, dimension. Not a rectangle. Not a rectangle at all. Dimension. All right. So. I don't know, let's start with 20 millimeters uh, on both the front and back. And for this, I'm gonna make the, I'm just gonna, you know, with my front dimension there selected, if I click on the rear dimension, it'll reference them and make them the same. Um, so like, th this is a really good example of like, I could have, oh, hello, where'd you go dimension? You just ran away. Um, I could have made that a parameter, but really, if I'm going to be thinking about the overall size of this box, I'm going to come back to this first sketch anyway and, and relay it out. Um, so, uh, you know, why not just sort of put it in the sketch? Um, and similarly, on this, so I don't need a whole lot of... Oh, man, you can't even see this. All right. I have to be better about that. Um, so here's what we've just done. We've made a rectangle. We've dimensioned it uh, 20 millimeters from the back of the board, 20 millimeters from the front of the board. Um, and on the sides, I don't need a ton of room. Um, let's say that, uh, this is going to be five millimeters to the side that way. And then, uh, we'll make this the same. Great. Um, I should also, so this, as I've been thinking about it, is going to be the interior footprint of the bottom of the box. Um, so I suppose another useful dimension might be, uh, let's see, let's make a parameter for um, for wall thickness uh, of this box. Let's say it's two millimeters for now. Um, so that the bottom of the box, the sides of the box, the top of the box are all going to be about the same thickness. Um, I might have to thicken up the top to make the, the threading work, but um, what I will now do is do an offset on this rectangle of well, thickness. So now this interior rectangle represents the free area in the bottom of the box, and this outer rectangle will actually represent um, the, the walls of the box, as it were. Um, great. Uh, just a little quick diversion. Um, YouTube is still saying the stream health is bad, um, and something about keyframes. Uh, someone out there in Chatsville, Kenneth, if you're out there, how how is the stream? Is it okay? Is it is it flagging? How is life? Um, all right, well, I think that's going to do it for this sketch. Let me stop sketch. I'm going to rename it uh, Box Base. Let's see. Aaron says fine. Thanks, Aaron. Great. So I don't, I don't know what stream health is about, but we'll figure it out later. Uh, all right, so now um, I'm going to come back and do this cutout feature later. So for now, I'm just going to do E for extrude. Like both of those profiles. It was like all three of those profiles. Good. Uh, I'm going to extrude them down. Wall thickness, no taper, new body. Yes. Great. All right. So now I have the bottom of my box. Um, now uh, to... I'm going to build the walls of my box. Why not? Um, and then I'm going to come back and do cuts in them later um, that will accommodate the uh, coax connectors and the power pole connectors. Um, but for right now, let's build the walls. Uh, let's see. Kind of says lag is, lag is a little, no lag, lower data rate video stream, but it's fuzzy. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, oh, Chris Wick. Hi, Chris Wick. 
I have a powerful fusion file I can share early time I'm using fusion. Yeah, sure. That'd be awesome. Um, we should definitely build those, build those power poles in. We have actually used Chris Wick's fusion file at work. Um, uh, Chris and Alec, I think put together a, um, a flush mount power pole, um, 3d printable adapter. They had some columns that they wanted a flush mount power pole in the back of, so it wouldn't protrude, but you could plug a practical into it on stage. Um, and we have actually, um, or actually Chris has printed some of those for us before. Um, so that'd be super cool. Yeah. I would take that model for sure. Uh, all right. Where were we? Walls. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't regret doing the offset on the bottom of sketch, but I'm actually going to do a new sketch on top of this box. Um, and I'm going to re offset inward because I want the, uh, this isn't actually necessary. Um, uh, never mind. I take it all back. So I'm going to delete that sketch because I have the detail that I need in, uh, this sketch. Let's make that visible again. And I'm going to want to extrude this upward, uh, to make the walls of the box. So how tall are they going to be? Well, Let's use our handy dandy measuring chompers. Tallest component currently is actually um, the 7805 in the back there, which is the bias regulator. And off of the PCB, that is going to be, as, as Jeff Glass soldered it this time, um, 21 millimeters uh, to the highest point. Um, and it's like, it's not, not particularly flush. It's sort of down to where those pins um, get a little bit fat, nothing particularly fancy about it. So 21 millimeters. So maybe let's make this box, I don't know, th let's say 30 millimeters tall to start with, uh, on interior space. So we'll make these actual walls, uh, 30 millimeters tall. Oops. Like that profile. We'll do 30 millimeters. Uh, oops. Uh, no, not 30 PCB to bottom 30 millimeters. And I suspect this is going not the way I want it to. So we'll actually tell it to go minus 30 millimeters and we'll do a join. And there we are. So this is one of those things that like I could make it a parameter because the height, the depth of that box is going to be something I'm going to want to futz with. Um, and making it a parameter would make it really simple. On the other hand, um, I think because we're only going to, I think we're only going to use that, that parameter in this one place. Um, and we're going to reference other geometry to it rather than making it a parameter. I think it's going to be okay just to leave it as a parameter of this extrude. Um, but I am going to name that extrusion. Okay. So we'll turn that first sketch off. Uh, so let's get into our standoffs, which were kind of the whole point of this thing. Um, so I'm going to make another sketch. Um, I'm going to see how well it treats me if I want to project just uh, one, two, and three holes in the PCB. I think that's going to be good. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be good. All right, so I'm actually going to turn off the PCB itself, so we're looking just at the holes. Um, so those are the actual holes in the PCB themselves, and let's just remind myself so those are uh 3.2 millimeters diameter yeah so they're they're sized for i built it i built it i punched them for an m3 screw um which will be great so now all i'm gonna do is do two circles uh the inner one which has diameter of neural hole and the outer one which has uh diameter neural standoff diameter Great. Well, I'm, I'm guess I'm really curious about if I go back and I update that PCB, right? If I, if, oh, you can't see what I'm doing. Thanks, Chris. I need like, um, I need like a standby light. I need like a little red light up here that tells me like what source I'm actually viewing from. Okay. So, so for the, the thing that I was hiding from you because you were looking at my uh, other camera, um, is I projected, uh, the holes on this PCB into the fusion sketch. And then I added two holes, uh, two circles, just concentric with that hole, uh, one for the knurled insert and one for the standoff. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. Um, so what I was starting to say is I am really interested to see how well this thing handles if 
I go back and I take my hole in my PCB in Eagle and uh, and I move it, you know, a millimeter or 10 millimeters or 100 millimeters, um, how well is that hole referenced in Fusion and is all this geometry, which should be, you know, it's co-centric with this projected circle. So if this was a Fusion component, when I moved the position of that hole on say just a native fusion component it would update the position of the center and everything would track with it i really hope that happens um, because if it doesn't then this whole um you know suck the pcb in to fusion is not it's not super useful like it would be almost better at that point to build your own fusion component um that had that geometry that you would adjust the geometry of the holes because then when you did move them around um you would uh, everything would update as you wanted it to. All right. So, all right, that's enough for that sketch. Um, so now all I'm going to do, uh, you know what I need? Is I need to know the depth of my three millimeter knurled inserts. I wonder if I have that in another project. I think I do. Um, let me... If you'll forgive me, well, a little diversion. I could go get one and measure it, but um, I have a project here that uh, I know printed and worked. Um, oh, this was kind of a useful one. This is not what I was thinking of, but you can look at it while I'm hunting through the rest of it. So all this was when I ordered those three millimeter inserts, all I did was print this test jig, um, and each of uh, each of these holes has a slightly different diameter by I think a tenth of a millimeter. Um, and so I just printed this out and then I inserted a knurled insert into each one of them and just saw which one it fit best. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, but the, that was not the project I was thinking of. I was thinking of, let's see, I think it's this. Oop. No, 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 no. Back up on the fourth. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, this has holes all the way through. So I'm thinking of this was a, a rack and pinion project, and I originally had knurled inserts inside these little holes here, um, but I see I've punched them all the way through, so this is not what I was thinking of. Don't save. Um, I was thinking, I hope I was thinking of this one. Uh, and in fact, it might be the updated version of this. I know I have a project where I basically, you know, have the... Um, just the depth of the knurled insert um, so that when you you put the knurled insert on the end of your soldering iron you melt it into the plastic and it would stop so it was just flush with the top of the plastic and that was really clutch um, if neither of these is the right project i'm just gonna i'm just gonna pause for three seconds and go ahead and grab one and measure it but let's see if we can do this uh on stream as it were um so this this was kind of a cool project and actually i should just go and get this because this turned out really nice um, so what this was, was a hobby motor, and that was just a model that I imported, um, from, uh, my mini factory, I think, um, and it would drive this, uh, partial involute gear, and it would drive this rack back and forth, um, just for fun, like, there was no practical project to this, but it was just a little, you know, geared things are fun, but if I take this rack away, yeah, this is what I was thinking of, so I would have a, uh, register, a knurled insert there with the screw head just protruding up through this slot. Um, and that would provide a little bit of additional um, captive force to keep this rack in place. Because otherwise it would try and jump out of the track. So let's turn that off. Let's just see how deep this hole was. Uh, this, uh, I don't want area. What do I want? I want the height. Let's about the height of that. Can I do that? Um, let's see. Base. Yeah, here we go. So here's the extrude that actually made that hole. That was three minus 3.1 millimeters. Great. Uh, great. Thanks, Past Jeff. Oh, so that's an interesting problem. So 3.1 millimeters is taller than I had intended on making the entire depth of the box and the standoff. Hmm. Well, so we have a few options. One would be to make, so currently the box is, what did I say, two, two millimeters deep? Two, yeah, each wall is two millimeters, and the PCB is 1.8 millimeters. So 
I could actually, I could fit the knurled standoff, the knurled um, copper in there, but then I would only have 0.7 millimeters of plastic between that knurled insert and the bottom of the box, which isn't the worst. I'm actually a little worried about it deforming. Um, well, per Kenneth's suggestion about, uh, you know, revamping this to uh, solder those FETs to the bottom instead of the top and bending them through, which totally seems like a thing, I'm going to go ahead I'm gonna cut back to fusion, um, and I'm going to make this standoff just a little bit taller. Um, so this is where that parameter is going to come in handy. So I'm going to say this was going to be 1.8. So if I make this, let's say I want... Um, actually, you know what? Let's make, let's do this a little bit backwards. We'll call this uh, neural st standoff height. And that's going to always be 3.1 millimeters. Um, so I would like to have, let's say, at least two millimeters of printing um, around this. So I really need to make uh, the PCB to bottom the same height as my standoff. Uh, so let's make this. So let's just do that. Here, let's just make this the same height as neural standoff height, which will be 3.1 millimeters for the time being. So that should update everything. So now when we turn our PCB back on, that should now be floating 3.1 millimeters above the bottom of that box. Um, I think the easiest way to, double, to verify that is going to be to inspect the bottom of that box. We'll turn that off, and we'll click on bottom layer of this PCB, 3.1 millimeters, you can see right there, yeah. So that's this is exactly why parameters are awesome, right? Because if you know in advance what you're gonna be mucking around with, then when you make a change, you don't have to you don't have to think about where it was in your sketch that you actually define that. You just go and you edit your parameter and all is good. All right, so I'm gonna turn that PCB back off again. And now I'm just gonna do my extrude. So the only thing that I, the thing I don't really love Oh, you know, here's what we'll do. So we'll extrude, we'll first extrude just the standoff outside of the neural, right? And we're going to extrude that a distance of uh, PCB to bottom because we want those to be touching the bottom of the PCB, right? And we'll join those, great. So now I have my little standoffs. And I actually, I'm not, I wish those were a little bit bigger. So let us uh, change that. So I have, currently they're two millimeters wider than the whole, let's make that four. Yeah, and all those updated, great. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna extrude these intersections. I'm going to extrude them. I don't know, I've never done this before. Let's see if it gets grumpy. I'm gonna extrude them a distance of PCB to bottom, right? So extrude them up to the bottom of the board and then take them back down the, uh, the height of the neural, right? So if these things were gonna be you know, 10 millimeters tall, then I would need the outer part to be 10 millimeters, and then I would need the inner part to be recessed at 3.1 millimeters. In this case, because I've actually set those heights to be equal, I'm going to extrude, you know, the outside's going to be 3.1 millimeters, and the hole in the middle is going to be 3.1 millimeters. So I don't know if it's going to let me do this, like, zero height extrude. Yeah, see, it won't. Ah, that's a bummer because I would like it to, when I update these heights later, for it to just update that. Oh, that's a bummer. You can't do a zero height extrude with parameters. Oh, all right, well, because I think I'm gonna want that to be the case later. Oh, you know what we should also find out is, so currently this is as if I'm doing, right, 3.1. What I'm wondering is if I'm, well, uh, here, let's make it just a little bit taller. We'll do this one step at a time, right? So we'll make it make the standoffs a little bit taller. Everything should have updated. Uh, I'm going to extrude those middle sections. Uh, and those are going to be PCB to bottom. Chris says, can you do a 0. .0001 someplace? I could. I could. I, do, I don't. I mean, yes, that will be the kludgy way to do it if I end up like this. I'm a little bit curious um, if I... If I if I set those distances differently and and do the extrude and then make them the same, is it going to cooperate? Um, so right now this is going to be a a 0 0.1 millimeter extrude, which it seems fine with, right? All right, so that was fine. So now if I take this to be 3.1 millimeters, one warning: extrude four, zero distance. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, 
but but did it actually reduce those? No. Uh, let's see. I want it's back to this plane and this plane. Zero millibytes. Yeah, so that seems to have worked fine. Um, it's just going to keep throwing me a warning because it's not actually extruding anything, but that is A-OK. -okay. So n here's a curious question. If I set this to be less than 3.1, right, in other words, to turn from an extrude into a cut, oh, let's certainly get rid of the error, uh, but it also didn't do the cut. Yeah, so it is, it's extruding in the correct direction, but it didn't change this operation to a cut. Hmm. Well, that's a little disappointing. That's a little disappointing. Um, it's not something I actually need. Um, I think I'm just going to make this just a little bit taller um, so that the there is actually a positive extrude down there. What I was hoping was if I, you know, going back to our, like, if the standoff was 10 millimeters tall and I then, like, cut down back... Oh, you know what I could do? You know what I should be doing? Uh, is doing this a whole different way. So, all right, we'll, we'll delete that. Um, we're going to go back into our extrude. Um, and I was talking through it out loud to you fine folks that made me think of this. So, instead of extruding um, just the... Uh, just the outer wall and then extruding the um, insert to a different height, I should just be extruding the whole post to whatever height I want. And then I'm gonna cut uh, the appropriate hole back down the middle of it for the neural insert from the top. So whether that top is 10 millimeters above or 3.1 millimeters above or two millimeters, it's all gonna work out just fine. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be much better. So I'll do an additional sketch uh, on each of these. And this is going to be uh, neural hole diameter. We will do, oops, project that. So when you um, when you start a sketch in Fusion, by default, um, it will project the planar features of um, whatever uh, face you start your sketch on, but it won't. Uh, project any coplanar faces. So in this case, I'm just projecting these circles onto the sketch and then um, I am uh, adding the sketch details from there. So we'll do neural hole diameter there, great. Stop sketch. Yeah, okay, so now instead of trying to extrude these upward from the base separately, what I really should be doing is uh, neural standoff height, is that the primary one? Neural, neural, standoff height. That's not a great name for that, but oops. To what happened there? So, all right. So distance one side, distance neural standoff height as if it was positive. And we'll do minus neural standoff height. We'll cut back into those. Cut. Great. There we go. Yeah, so same result, but now whether that extrusion puts the hole down into the base or uh, or not, it shouldn't matter because it's just cutting through that hole solid. Tremendous. Great. Well, there's my basic box with standoffs uh, that we were looking for. So now uh, let's do a lid for this thing. And I'm actually, I'm going to add some features to the base um, to help us define our lid. So... While we're still in our box bottom, make a sketch on this layer. I'm going to turn my PCB off again. Uh, and I am going to uh, do some more knurled inserts in the corner here. Um, I love the heat insert knurled inserts. Um, the best place to get them is China. Um, you can get a knurling, uh, knurled insert insert tool, which is basically just a pointy soldering iron head. Oops. Um, from McMaster car, um, but it's really expensive and I don't know exactly why you would do that um, when a $15 Radio Shack soldering iron and a cheapy Chinese set of them um, is just is the best tool for the job. All right, so I'm going to basically define this geometry in one corner and then I'm just going to mirror it around so it ends up in the other corners as well. Um, so I think... 
Uh, let's make this. Uh, we'll make this the radius of the circle plus. Uh, I don't know, three millimeters? Sure. And then we will space this out as well. I'll make that the same. Great. Uh, and now I'm going to define a rectangle. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a little post in these corners um, that the lid can sit on. And I guess if we were going to be classy about it, we could do this as an inset lid. Um, like that the lid would sit within the boundaries of this top, but I, I don't actually know that that's necessary um, since we're going to have screw inserts on all of the corners. Um, and I think I will probably use pan head screws so that they're flat, um, which uh, so will have a nice flush surface, although that will have some um, bearing on the depth of the lid itself. And I guess we'll have to make a decision as to whether that lid is then going to be thicker than all the walls. Um, all right, so let's go back over to our sketch here. Um, and I actually think, I think this is probably a little too much. I'm going to make that two millimeters. Um, and I'm going to make this dimension the same as that. And this dimension also the same as that. Yeah, so we have this post uh, with a hole right in the middle of it. Hmm. Yeah, I think this will be fine. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do before I leave that sketch... I wish there was a, a sort of a shortcut way to do this because I find myself doing it a lot. I'm gonna make a construction line in the midpoint of that side. I'm gonna make a construction line in the middle of that side. I'm going to take this geometry and mirror it over, uh, oops, uh, not that line. That's gonna be my mirror line. Uh, and then I'm going to do it again, and I'll have all four posts that are the same, and they're all based on that same geometry. Um, you can, sometimes I have found, if you're doing a lot of mirroring, a mirroring especially, not so much dimensioning, but with the mirror tool, if you're relying on mirroring a lot, um, you can get what feel like floating point errors in your placements, especially when it comes to like this identify face feature of Fusion. Um, like you'll end up in a point where, you know, this is, a, you know, a, for example, it's, it's not happening here, but you know, this is a perfect rectangle that Fusion has created for us. You know, I take this, which intersects uh, the top of the rectangle there and there. I mirror it across one way, mirror it twice, mirror it again. And suddenly this corner, maybe these points are non-coincident by, you know, 0. 0.00001 millimeters, right? Um, I don't know enough about fusion to say that that's actually a, like a float, a true floating point error. Um, but that's what it feels like. And it's super frustrating because the whole point of doing all of this is like now all of these posts are identical and they're all based on essentially two dimensions, right? Cause they're all referencing each other. And then you get to the final point of your design and suddenly things are not lining up. If I can think of a specific example that I've hit that and I'll go, I'll, I'll pull it up and show you, um, I'm trying to remember what, what project. I have this very vivid image of trying to do a chamfer on multiple faces and it just not playing nice. Um, so what I'm going to do now is do, oops, do another extrude. And I'm going to extrude all of this geometry um, all the way upwards. So, right, so we're not making our holes at this point, um, but I think I'm going to be happier with uh, doing the same thing I did. I'm going to extrude those posts all the way to the top and then I'm going to cut the knurled insert back in. And I actually, I'm realizing there is something uh, that I should have done first, which is define the top plane here. So I'm going to do an offset plane with an offset of zero millimeters. And then I'm going to extrude to that plane um, so that uh, when I change the height of this box, uh, everything changes with it. So this is a consequence of not making the height of the box a parameter, right? Like I could just you know, extrude the same amount. Um, so I'm do extrude, uh, direction one side, two object, my object is the plane at the top of the box, uh, join. Great, great. So now I have those all nice and flush. Uh, and then I'll create a sketch on this top layer. I'm gonna turn the sketch I just did back on and I'm gonna project those circles back into this box if it'll let me. Uh, I guess I'll turn 
this body off so I can see the actual sketch. One, two, come on. Come on, project, project. There we go, project. Oh, this one didn't take project, project, and project. So in this case, what I've done, um, because I used the size of the neural insert hole itself to define how big I wanted this post to be, I feel pretty good about having the, um, the hole be defined in the previous sketch and then extrude it above it and then I'm gonna cut back in this sketch. Like really, this is the place where that information is gonna be used. Um, but by having it in the previous sketch, it allows this post, which has to be extruded first, to be driven by this hole, even though it's gonna be extruded second. Right, so now I do one, I do two, I do three, I do four, and I'm gonna extrude the minus knurled hole standoff height. Cut, yes, good, cut, great. And I'm gonna turn that sketch back off. All right, so there's our box, three standoffs, uh, uh, holes for the lid. That's pretty good. Uh, let's build a lid real quick. All right, so now, so I'm gonna change components at this point. We go to our box top. Uh, and I'm gonna start with a sketch on this top face. Stop sketch, it's just a rectangle. Um, all right, so this is the point where I gotta think about the thickness of this lid if I wanna use um, pan head bolts so that this gets flush. So let's do a fun thing here, which most of you have probably done before. Well, first we'll save, which I hope all of you have done before. And then let's insert from the McMaster car catalog. Um, this feature is really cool in theory um, I wish this window behaved a little bit more like an actual web browser because there are some features of it that I find lacking. Um, but for something like finding a screw or a bolt or whatever, um, I think it's it's pretty nifty. Um, what I have are uh, Phillips flathead screws. Uh, thread size is metric. M3. Uh, let's say, mm, yeah, I should think about thread depth at this point um, because the knurled insert is only three millimeters tall and if the, the top is, uh, if the shaft is any bigger than two millimeters, it's going to have bearing on um, how tall this lid has to be if this is going to be flush. Uh, I am fairly confident I have some six millimeter ones. I don't think I have anything smaller than six millimeters, which is gonna make this lid kind of chunky, which is a little bit of a shame. Well, let me tell you what, let's do, let's start with four millimeters and I can always go back and change it. Um, so, does this window get bigger? Yeah, there we go, all right. Um, metric steel flathead screw, 3.3 by 0.5, four millimeters long. This product detail, come down here. Uh, I think the step will be fine. Let Fusion do its thing. Uh, McMaster doesn't let my tendency to middle click stuff in a new time slot. I know, yeah, I wish McMaster lets you middle click. Um, I wish you could like easily, like, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a huge pain. Uh, MasterCard anywhere is easier to search than Granger. Yeah, it's true. I heard a thing the other day. Where did I hear this from? It might have been Kenneth. It sounds like a thing Kenneth would say. Um, apparently, um, Granger will source you anything. If you, I don't know if that's like an account-based thing or whatever. But Granger, if you call up and you're like, "Hey, I need uh, this," they will get it for you for a price, um, which is pretty cool. Um, I I can't imagine that's cost effective uh, for most things, but um, but it's kind of cool that that service is out there. All right, so I'm gonna move and copy components. I don't want to move the box bottom. I want to move you. So I'm gonna do first a rotation. Of, doo, doo, doo. Okay, 
And then I'm going to... Granger always gives me flack for being a multi-million dollar. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Now, Granger will also, like, like all these companies are just business to business, but Granger really doesn't check. Like, you can just make, uh, you know, your own uh, corporation uh, and say, hey, I am so-and-so unlimited. Sell me things. And Granger will be just fine with that, it turns out. Um, so I'm going to do a point-to-point -point move now that we're rotated here. Is it going to let me do... I hope that selected the center of that. This is another area where Fusion is just chokes a little bit, is this point-to-point -point move tool, which is usually what I want, right? I want to move this specific point on this specific screw, and I want to move it so that it lines up with you know, the point at the bottom of this hole. Oh, well, hey, there we go. Yeah, awesome. So now I've got that screw just chilling. That's pretty cool. Chris says, could you do a joint connection for the screw and then copy? You could. Um, I try to leave my joints for the end if I'm going to be using my components to define the geometry of my shape, which I am in a second here. Chris says, you have nothing to join it to. Yeah, exactly. There's not an actual component here yet. Um, but now I'm going to move and copy. Uh, selection, components, this guy. Point copy, create copy, create copy. Yeah, there we go. So now, what is this plane? Is this just a rendering? All right, I would like it to be, no, 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 what are you? Are you a construction plane? Are you a body? You're a body. Uh, all right, let's try again. Box bottom, deselect. What are you? What is this plane? Just, just muttering on stream. Don't mind me. Um, is it my sketch? It's my sketch. There we go. Okay. So components, this component, point to point. Um, I'm going to take center point there. Uh, I'm going to create copy. I am going to bring my model back. Uh, sorry, create, select that component, point to point. Oh, man. It's interesting when you, if you deselect your your component selection, it, it re-updates all your visibility settings to what they were when you started your selection, which is not what I, not what I would have chosen. All right, so select that, turn that off, select my point. Turn the body back on. Come over here. Point to point. Or oh, man, origin point. This is just thrilling. This is like target point. How about pattern the screw instead of copy? I could pattern it. Um, if you, can you do a pattern with driven dimensions? Like, can I have the pattern reference the dimensions of um, either a sketch or this like hold to hold distance? Cause I want this pattern to automatically update when I change the dimensions of this box. And if I doing it with the geometry, um, it will it will snap to that point guaranteed. I guess let's find out. Oh, and of course with all that, I didn't select make copy. So you get to watch this again. Here, I'll tell you what, we'll do this one the old fashioned way, um, and then I'll do one, um, we'll try the pattern. All right, we're doing point to point. Our component is this one. Our origin point is this one. Our, uh, our target point is in the hole. Create copy, okay, okay. So I have two screws, which <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah, this is like, I'm like a, a freshman shop intern, but I placed like one screw in three minutes. I'm really proud. Um, let's, let's try the pattern, Chris. Let's see if that happens. Um, so I'm gonna go in here, pattern. We'll do a rectangular pattern. I'll pattern on components. I'll do those two screws, direction, I'll do that way. Distance type uh, extent, 
Let's press quantity two, distance. Now this is what I want to know. Can I, uh, let's see, we'll do zero in that direction. Can I reference this? See, this is where I think I'm going to get hung up, is I don't think I can reference like the spacing in between these two holes, um, which I could, I could figure out a way to make that a parameter, um, but I think I think I'm not going to like how how fiddly that makes this design. Uh, symmetric. Yeah, unless there's something I'm not thinking of here to get it to reference this geometry, I think I would have to do a move copy. Is there anything else that would can pattern on path? It's my path, distance, and quantity. It's not really what I want. Can I? Because I don't. I mean, I could. I could draw a path. Let's see. Let's do. I guess we'll do a sketch on this face here. And we'll try, let's just try drawing a line from, um, uh, let's see, which hole did I base that on? This one, I think. A line from there to center line of this other hole. And we'll see if this pattern on path thing has any legs. Because if it does, that would be great. Like this whole copy and paste one at a time thing is a total bummer. Chris says, can you dim the model sketch and then reference that dim as the needed distance? Maybe. Maybe. Like, yeah, like, do it with... Now, but to... Uh, it's, a, it's a thought. That's essentially what I'm going to do here, right? Like, I'm going to have this line. I'm going to have a driven dimension on it. Um, and then we'll just see what the right tool is, right? So, let's see. Uh, but I also... I can't... I don't think I can access dimensions by reference outside of that sketch right because like if i'm in that sketch i get that driven dimension but if i as soon as i stop sketch i don't get access to that dimension anymore but let's try this let's try this uh pattern on path thing all right so i've got one component two components let's use this as our path uh Oh, it threw me a warning that says this is an invalid input setting. I don't know what that means. Let's find out. So if I were to do 10 millimeters, quantity 2, quantity 1, quantity 2. Yeah, so I've got my spaces. So, but again, like I'm trying to, you can if you know the dimension number. Oh, interesting. Says, so hmm, okay. Let's let's give that a try. So, does that hold? Uh, that does that hold for driven dimensions, Chris? Because this doesn't isn't giving me a a dimension number. Let's find out. It'd be one thirty two six. Uh, and this would be what are you sketch two? Yeah, this uh, Chris, keep them coming. I will take, I will take any suggestions. Um, what is this called? Box top. Uh, why do I not have any parameters here for box top? Unless I'm just blind. Box top. Box top. Now I have box bottom parameters, but I don't have box top parameters. That's super weird, right? I'm not crazy. What happens if I'm not in that component? Yeah, like I have all of my box bottom, but not box top, right? I'm not crazy, right? I mean, not about this. Oh, uh, st story out loud while we're thinking about how to, how to tweak this. Um, so uh, Alec Thorne, who many of you will know, um, the other day comes over the radio at Shakes and just says, uh, hey, Jeff Glass, you're not crazy. And <laughs> that was the whole thing. Uh, I was like, what? So we had this weird thing going on. So we have a, new, a paradigm system in the new theater um, that 
uh, we had added some uh, relay, some, actually some dimmed circuits to as work lights, um, and we went in to so we we got paradigm trained recently and so we just went in and edited the preset in the uh, light designer software and added those circuits into like the big works button so like whenever you turn on the works all the fluorescents turn on but so do these three dimmed circuits um and i put them in there and then i walked over to the panel and i clicked on it and these led work lights did the strangest thing they uh turned like they they turned on at like five percent and then immediately faded out when the button was pressed and I couldn't for the life of me. I thought I was maybe going insane. I've also had issues syncing Light Designer with the PACP, so I thought it was that. In any case, didn't really pursue it. Um, Alec was doing some cleanup on the, the file and discovered that the master button, which basically just runs a big, long macro because it has to change all the button stations and all the presets, um, was not only was it triggering the Masterworks preset, but later on it was also just defaulting to taking all of the dimmed channels in the theater to zero um, because the original programmer's assumption is uh, was why, like, why would you want anything beyond just the work lights on? Why would you want dimmers on? Um, and so what it was doing was it was turning on that preset and then like 600 milliseconds later was turning those circuits right back off. So it was exactly what I saw. It would turn on just a little bit and then fade right back out. Super weird. I'm glad we caught it. So now we've, we've modified that macro so that it doesn't do that anymore, um, which is super nice. Um, just for the sake of moving forward, I'm going to do um, a, just do this as a move and copy uh, just because I want to keep building this box. But I will take further thoughts as they come along because this would be this would be good functionality. Travis says, oh, Travis Shoop's here. Hey, Travis. Uh, that's an awful macro. Yeah. Oh, man. Do I? I don't think I have a copy of, of uh, that that show file on um, uh, the PACP file on this computer. But yeah, the, the listen, we're all professionals here. There was, uh, there were some choices made in the programming of the PACP. In fairness, uh, those who were allowed to be involved in the process, which was not me, made some assumptions about how the system would work um, and didn't do a lot of communicating. So assumptions got made on both sides. Now that we have the keys to the kingdom, uh, we got to um, tidy things up just a little bit. Thank goodness. Uh, let's do this. Move, copy. Uh, we'll do this as components. We'll do both. We can also, we can do both of these components at once, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, do a point to point, do an origin point. We will do, uh, is it gonna let me? Can I do, uh, I guess I'll turn, oh no, I need that on. Ah, uh, I need that on. Gonna let me select what I want to, if I just get in there real close, if I just get in there real tight. Oh no, um, I guess I can, uh, we'll do this the other way around. We can turn that off, we can leave that on, go from this point to a point on the box itself. Okay, target point, create copy, should have both of those there. Okay, great. Yeah, oh yeah, awesome. Kenneth Finnegan says, to be fair, Jeff is still crazy, but for other, yeah, it's, mm, that's, mm. thanks Kenneth. Uh, don't, make us, <laughs> don't make assumptions for me. Uh, yeah, light designer training. Yes, light designer training has been super valuable. So for those who, who haven't played with it, um, uh, e ETC, Electronic Theater Controls, makes a line of uh, architectural control systems called the Paradigm System. Um, it's one of their family of control devices. And um, they make a program which allows you to make modifications for it called Light Designer and a separate program for touch screens called Control Designer. And they don't give you that software until you've gone and or, or had someone come out and done training with it. Um, because understandably, like ETC's whole thing is, uh, does it change the paradigm? So ETC's whole thing is they have really excellent customer service. Um, Let's see, what is this sketch? Oh, that was my rectangle from way back when. <laughs> That's fine. Um, they have really, really excellent customer service. You can call them up during business hours pretty much any time, and they have a team of great technical support folks ready to help you. Um, they can also, um, uh, you can call their emergency line. They do all of great things. You know, their their service is really what they're built on, and you, you pay for that with the cost of their gear because it's not cheap. Um, so 
the sort of social contract that you agree to. I don't think it's a literal contract, but, the, but it was said in very, in very much these words, like they don't want to give the tools to make modifications to someone and then have you break your system and then have that become a burden on their help desk, right? Like that's not, by making changes to it, you assume some responsibility for um, the changes that you make. Um, and so their, their for the first option would be to sort of have their, um, th they'd like to have their sort of trained techs or their distributors come and make those changes. But if you really need flexibility, um, they're happy to train you. And they were great. We had David Fox, who's a super great trainer over there. He wrote a lot of the code is my understanding. Um, He's just a really swell guy, so that was super helpful. Um, so, sort of getting back to this, I think what I'm going to do is just make this as high as the top of these four millimeter screws, and then and then some. So let's do an offset plane here. Uh, do it by 0.6 millimeters, and then oops, I don't need to create another sketch. Sorry, go away, sketch, go away. Okay, uh, I'm just going to extrude this rectangle. Uh, and this face to plane we just created, new body, new body. Great. All right, so there's my lid. Ooh, and I didn't extrude those screw holes, which is fine. It's not exactly what I meant to do. Uh, let's step back in the timeline a little bit. Okay, so Travis Shoup here. This is super great timing. Um, so Travis and I were having a cool chat the other day because of a project we've been working on about um, 3D drafting programs. And he and Lee do a fair amount of drafting in uh, in Vectorworks. Um, let's see, I'm gonna actually have to move this sketch after these inclusions to make this work. So I'm actually gonna delete a couple things. Um, which makes all the sense in the world, Travis. Like you do so much work in Vectorworks as a lighting person. Like that is clearly the most comfortable tool. Um, the timeline feature is really where Fusion 360 shines, um, in my opinion. All right, so we're gonna create a sketch there, and I'm gonna actually project. Yeah. So here's what I do. So I'm gonna project these screw heads. 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 Oh, it's already done it. Okay, great. Um, so, so the timeline feature, right, is a blessing and a curse um, because it's when when it's serving you right, it's super powerful. Um, when it's not serving you, or when you um, do something out of order you're kind of boned and you like, you have to start, you have to think of it both as a, um, a timeline based program that you sometimes have to interact with in a non timeline based way. Uh, so what I think I'm going to do here, how do I want to handle this? So I'd love to have a chamfer, uh, a beveled edge inside this hole. So these screws really are, are captive. I wonder what that angle is. Is that just 45 degrees? I think so. Let's see. I think, uh, I think what I would like to do is intersect. Yeah, so the intersect tool uh, is very cool. So I get the intersection of this screw head and the top of the plane of the top of the box. Right, so I want this face, I want this face, I want this face, and I want this face. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to go turn those bodies off so I can work with that sketch. Um, yeah, so this project that, that Travis and I have been working on, which has been super cool, um, is a... So I, I confess I don't 100% understand what the rig is down there, Travis. Like I haven't I haven't asked for all the deets, um, but essentially there. I hope I'm not giving the game away. Yeah, give me all caps if I'm not supposed to spill some secrets. Um, but the spotlights down at Santa Fe Opera are um, DMX controlled, essentially network controlled, right? Um, so they can be locally controlled by a little network attached um, slide rheostat that they have there that I think Fleener built for them. Travis says, go for it. Yes. Um, uh, or they can be controlled with a console or both, right? Um, 
and so they're not controlled on little manual dimmers. They don't have little like the little um, whoever makes those little tiny like strap it to a pipe uh, dimming packs. Um, they're on the true sensor three dimming. Huzzah huzzah. Um, so the project we've been working on is building um, a little network monitor. So I'm distracting myself. I think this is the right geometry. I think this is right. Um, so that the spot ops could see the level of their spot when they're operating it manually. So basically it's slurping um, network lighting data, which is uh, SACN off the network and displaying it on a little screen. Uh, and that's all there is to it. It's uh, We're running it on an, uh, just an Arduino Mega. Um, it, uh, an Uno would, would have been fine, except the graphics library that we're using is pretty beefy um, and just, just takes up a lot of um, uh, system space. And so we uh, just ran out of memory. So we went up to a Mega just because it was easy. And we're I think we're talking, we, Travis built five of these, I think, ultimately. Um, so like we're not talking like an, an, any need to do um, any kind of industrial sized run of these things. Um, so Omega was just the easiest way to go. Um, and they have a little, uh, 128 by 64 monochrome screen. Oh, this is not what I meant to do. Um, this is what I get for telling story as well while doing extrudes. Let's go back a step here. Um, so what do I want to do? I want to I want to do this extrude with all of the geometry, and then I want to go back and cut these at an angle. That's what I want to do. Um, so, so yeah, so that's been the project. It's been super cool. Um, it's been super fascinating. I've learned a ton about what ETC is doing under the hood with their um, with their network. So, including so this was the the sort of the biggest gotcha. So, um, uh, SACN streaming ACN um, is basically just at, at its heart, DMX packets, like DMX 512 uh, packets wrapped up uh, into uh, usually a UDP packet um, and flopped over the network. And at the other end, they, you know, basically deserialize it back into a D, uh, DMX packet and send it out over 5-pin um, XLR. You know, there's really nothing fancy about it, um, except that it, so it inherits all the properties of DMX over that you could put over a you know a five wire cable like you would have done for the past twenty years, um, so um, that includes things like alternative start codes. So we think of DMX in lighting as having five hundred and twelve possible slots of data, right? Eight bit slots, five hundred and twelve of them slurping over the wire. Um, the standard uh more or less defines it as 513 slots of data and the first slot or slot zero is the start code um and for for generic dmx data like lighting control data anything that's flowing out of your network node into a physical cable you know almost all of the time that start code is going to be zero zero um but it doesn't have to be so when um, I guess it would have been ESTA released that standard originally. Uh, they made provision for alternative start codes. So they were like, well, maybe um, like one or two manufacturers would like to send some other kind of data over uh, a DMX line so it could get to their fixtures. Um, and, you know, it could do diagnostics or it could be some kind of like mode setting. Like we'll build in this one 8-bit essentially manufacturer field um and everyone will just like eight bits should be enough for everybody basically um and that filled up almost immediately um with manufacturers placing their claims on it uh so actually i will take a quick a quick diversion uh here we go sorry i know it's supposed to be a drafting stream it's also a lighting stream uh, here we go. Alternative start codes. So now ESTA still maintains this list of alternative start codes. Let me drag this over here. Make sure you can see that. Yeah, cool. So this is this is the 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 canonical list of alternative start codes. Um, and you can see companies like the White Rabbit Company, T Recursive, Goddard Co. Like 
all of these things, which are like many of them went through and actually registered with the ESTA and said, hey, I have dibs on, you know, 07. I have dibs on, you know, 1A is going to do something. And like this is the actual submitted text that Integrated Theater submitted so many years ago. Anyway, to make a long story short, ETC has registered start code DD, and thankfully they have their one paragraph of submission is the documentation for it, which is if you see a DMX packet with start code DD, that is per address priority for that DMX or ACN source, right? So every ACN packet has a priority from zero to 200, but um, the ETC also sends these special priority packets um, so that if your system is capable of doing per address priority, you can listen for those packets um, and sort of adjust your behavior based on that, which is super cool um, functionality, but the ACM library we were using wasn't di didn't properly account for the alternative start codes. Um, in fact, what it was doing um, was uh, it was checking that the start code that it was seeing was valid, but only after it was integrating the data in that packet in a highest takes precedence sense with the data it had already seen, right? So in, in the order of things, what it should have been was, you know, I see new ACN packet, I check that its start code is double zero and is actually data, I, I do everything else, right? What it was doing was I see a new ACN packet, I don't take any action yet, but let me see, do I have a higher value for channel one? Do I have a higher value for channel two? And basically filling its buffer with all its appropriate values. And then only after all of that, it said, hey, was this a valid start code? Oh, it wasn't a valid start code. Oh, well, let's just move on, right? So it would, periodically, we would see flashing on this device to um, the value 39%, uh, which is the same as uh, 100 out of 255. Um, because this is the, the, the priority value was encoded as 64 in hex, which is um, 100 which uh, 100 out of 255 is about 39%. Um, so one pull request later and uh, everything is working fine. But it's like that kind of, you know, sort of edge case, like what is ETC actually doing on their network? Um, that's been super cool to like work on this project with. Um, and it's cool that it actually sees some use. We're still like probably gonna do a rev 1.2 of the software. Like it's not as responsive as it could be. So IO Travis, like one more draft, um, but yeah, it's been pretty cool. All right, so I'm finally getting around to cutting out these screw holes. I am going to do an extrude. I am going to do this to the surface of my lid, and I'm going to do them at a taper angle of 45 degrees. Cut. Okay, so there's my lid. Call that good. We'll come back and get fancy with it later, but for now, that'll be great. What I really should probably do is... Um, building a little tolerance in this little part, but it's getting a little bit late. I probably have about 20 to 30 more minutes in me before uh, I go and celebrate Mary Hungerford's birthday. Uh, so let's see if we can finish this thing off. So we have a few more things to do. <laughs> Chris, I'm sure you will find a use uh, for this thing. What's So it's cool, and I will I will find a place to put this code up. Um, now that we've got it working, like it's basically the, the only reason it has to be on a mega is for the graphics library. Without that, you could run it on an Uno or some other 32U4 based Arduino. Um, and then you basically have an Arduino that can listen to ACN, um, for the cost of a network shield and an Arduino knockoff. Um, I have been trying to get it working. I wonder if I have a little baggie here somewhere. Oh, I think it's on the other bench. Um, I have been trying to get it working with the little nano clones, um, but the the network shield that you can mostly get for those Arduino nanos, you know, the super slim ones, has a different Wi-Fi chip. Um, it has a different networking library. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to just use that one. Um, but then you would have, you know, a thing the size of a pack of Tic Tacs that spoke ACN, which would be cool. Okay, what else do we need to do? So we need to account for the FET hole in the bottom um, and then what the heck do we do about heat sinks? So let's turn the top off now. We'll turn the PCB back on. We'll go back into our box bottom component. So we'll, we'll cut a hole in the bottom of this thing. So I'll create a sketch. Sketch in the bottom layer. Let's see if I project. Yeah. 
So it's it's done a pretty good job, Fusion has, of bringing in, like, all of the various geometry. Like, this rectangle was just like a, a, keep, a keep out rectangle in Eagle, which it slurped in, which is kind of cool. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about this about this tool. Um, I think that'll be good. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll turn off that PCB. Um, yeah, and so now I'm gonna make the hole in the bottom of this even just a little bit larger still. Let's make this because this hole has a little bit of clearance on it um, already around the fets. So I'm gonna make a little bit more clearance. Oh uh, no, let's make just reference this. Just give this a little bit more clearance than the PCB has, so we know we're in a good shape. All right, so we got that. We'll reference that one more time. Great, stop sketch. We'll do an extrude. We'll go to object, go bottom of the box, cut. Great, great, bottom of the box with a hole in it. Yeah, and if we were to look up through that hole, we would see the fets, the bottom side of the fets. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I gotta say, like I this the I still have questions about how this workflow works, but um, like as a as a project planning tool, like this is this is kind of neat. Um, all right, so now all we really need is uh, six holes. I need holes for uh, that's not true. I need eight holes. I need a, uh, BNC in for RFN, BNC out for RF out, two indicator LEDs, two switches, two sets of power poles. That's eight. Um, so, shall we see, <laughs> shall we see if you can, uh, if, if uh, McMaster Car sells BNC connectors? Anyone wanna bet if, if McMaster Car sells BNC connectors? Um, let's do that in that box bottom. Survey says, BNC. Uh, oh, they have coaxial adapters. They have adapters. They have keystone jacks. They have cables. Uh, they have inline connectors. They have caps. Ooh, it's not looking good, is it? Oh, darn. Well, that is... That is a bummer. Oh, hey, while I figure out how I'm gonna solve that issue, let me take you off of the computer screen for a sec. <laughs> um, Travis, at some point, we'll have to share uh, a really a nice picture of what the um, Spotlight Monitor project looks like, but uh, I will also show you what my uh, prototype looks like, because it's just sitting next to me here. Uh, it's so jank, oh man. I took the I topped the the Wi-Fi shield off of it the other day because we were trying to solve some power issues. Oh god! Oh god! I mean, it's fine. Like it works. Um, it works just fine. <laughs> but it is not. It's not the prettiest thing. Although, I've, if oh, I don't have a, a network available. This is the other thing: is the network library we're using. If you don't have it on a network, it will hang. Um, looking for one for quite a long time, which is kind of a bummer. But so I can't really show you the functionality of this thing, but I could turn it on and uh, show you the flash screen. Yeah, yeah, it's cute. Put the little SFO logo in there. Anyway, all right. Ah, oh, back to Fusion. <laughs> Cass says, nice bell wire. Ooh, I have a story about bell wire um, that I don't, I can't tell, I can't tell on stream. Um, but basically, to keep some members of my extended family happy, we, not that long ago, Mary and I found ourselves buying some emergency bell wire and alligator leads in a Home Depot uh, urgently. Um, I can't. Wish I could say more, but I think there's a non-zero chance that people will someday watch this stream, um, and it would be bad. In any case, um, we were doing uh, coax 
uh, pass-throughs and switch pass-throughs. So um, let me take a real quick... Do, do, do. Just pull up some dimensions on a uh, BNC connector. So let's try and get this right the first time. Uh, Travis says, try dropping a photo in the thread won't let me. Oh, Kenneth, you're a stream admin, I think. Do you, do you have any way of enabling pictures in, in the chat? Let's see here. So I am just going to steal the dimensions off of a generic coax connector, and I think that's going to be just fine. I really should have one in my library somewhere anyway, but for today, we're going to be a little lazy. So I guess uh, I could make it line up with... Oh, I'm on the wrong side. Ooh, good. Um, I could make it line up with the like the pads for the coax exactly but i think that's actually going to make it a little bit harder so i'm going to go aesthetically like you know a third of the way out along this center point in either direction so do a sketch on this face i'm going to project my uh faces in here so that i'm sure i'm actually cutting into the parts that aren't taken up by these posts okay great uh, let's see. Try and manage the stream. I don't think photos are a thing. Ah, Chris linked me his power pole file. Oh, that's cool. Only admins can include URLs, and I can still only use 200 characters at a time. Wow. Interesting. I mean, Travis, if you if you can sneak in like a imager link to the photo, we could see that. And the way like Chris snuck a link in there. Um, it's because it's really, it's really cool. Um, it really has turned out really nice. So let's see. So a coax hole seems to be 9.6 millimeters in diameter. And then it has two non-spin cutouts, which are going to be uh, I guess I didn't really need that center construction line. Uh, uh, I might have, actually. So this is going to be dimensioned here. Uh, it's uh, 8.3 between the two of them. Yeah, that looks right. And then I'm just going to mirror this across that line. Um, most of you probably know the uh, ribbon up here is customizable. Um, I really like having mirror on my... Uh, on my ribbon up here just because I use it a lot. Okay, so now it's time to think about placement. So I think, so I wanna, I'm gonna wanna be well above the PCB, right? Cause I'm gonna just bodge wire this in with um, some coax, some like RG, I bought a little bit of RG318. That's this, uh, this super slim, uh, pretty flexible. It's meant for like portable operating and like, uh, you know, a uh, hundred Watts or so. Um, but it's super fine. I was using some RG58 for a while for like scratch projects and it was just not worth it. So I bought like a 50 foot roll of RG318 um, on eBay and that's been pretty great. Sneak a what link? Oh, Travis, I was thinking um, Imgur, I-M-G-U-R. It's just a, a, it's a super easy image host because um, it seems like if you can't post pictures, but um, but you could, you know, uh, you could post a link to an image. We could all have a, a fun look at that. Or you could send me the image and I can put it on the stream. That'd be cool. Um, okay, so let us think one more sec about this this coax placement. So first, I know I'm going to mirror this across the center line. So let's do a construction line um, centered on. Yeah, we go center. Boop. Oops. No, no, no. Construction line. Oh, it's, I'm getting all of the various matching points that the thing could possibly be. Well, that's unfortunate. If I turn off PCB, will it still do that? Yeah, there we go. Center line, vertical, great. Uh, all right, and let's make this... Uh, well, it's, this is kind of just an, an arbitrary aesthetic choice. Ooh! <laughs> well, that's not... 
That's not what I meant. So though, something is not not constrained. I think this is actually not. Uh... There we go. Yeah, so I thought it was constrained. You can do this horizontal vertical constraint, which is super helpful. And I thought it often defaults to that, but I guess this time it did not. Um, actually, let's let's space this out a little bit more, because I'm gonna have one coax connector coming out one side, one coming out the other side. I'm gonna have two indicator LEDs in the middle. So um, let's constrain this so that we're doing just fine. So we'll dimension this above the bottom. So this is gonna be above the PCB. So let's do let's make it pretty high. I think that'll be good. Uh, and then we will mirror this across center. Okay, so there's that. Um, and then I'm gonna have uh, two three millimeter, two three millimeter LEDs. Um, oops, poking through. Um, one of which um, indicates. So the whole point of this board is that when you push uh, RF in the input connector. Uh, if it's this little bit of circuitry here, if it senses RF, I can actually, we can look at this on a schematic. So the whole point is um, RF comes in. Uh, this right here rectifies the RF and charges uh, this capacitor, uh, which turns on this NPN transistor, which drives those relays, right? So whenever you have RF flowing in, the relays turn on and we go through the amplifier. Um, so we've got two indicator LEDs, one of which is in parallel with the relays, um, so we'll turn on whenever the relays are activated. And then I have this uh, RF sensing circuit, which is untested. I, I put this on the schematic without testing it, so shame on me. Um, but this should be um, a small sample of the output RF to drive it, another LED. So if I was sending, if I was uh, doing voice communications, uh, when I first key the mic, the relay should click and the relay LED should be solid. And then um, when I talk, the LED would, would light up in time with my voice. So I'd have two different um, confirmations of, uh, of what was happening inside of the amplifier. That's the idea anyway. All right, we got that. We're going to just dimension this. This is the kind of thing that like I, I, in a project like this, I wouldn't necessarily have to dimension right, because I'm making sort of more or less an aesthetic choice about front panel layout. Um, I just like to have everything dimensioned at the end of the day um, because it gives me just a little bit more confidence that when I change things, things aren't going to go, you know, if I were to change a, a parameter way back at the beginning of this project, some of these later unconstrained dimensions could go screwy, you know, like we saw when that line shot off into nowhere. Like it's just a, just a, a nice safeguard that things aren't are going to behave like I think they will. Okay, so select those four. We'll do extrude two. We'll do the back side of this. So we'll do a cut, cut. All right. So that's my my uh, coax and my LEDs. Uh, and now I need two switches uh, and my uh, power poles. Okay, so let's save. We haven't saved in a while. That's sort of exciting. I'm going to see if I can slurp down uh, Chris Wick's power pole file uh, and see if we can include that, because that would be classy. A360.co, A360.co, slash 2P2N182. Survey says... Dun, 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 dun. Power pole connector. Sure is thinking about it. Dun, dun, dun. Thinking about it. Ooh. I got little dots. It's a good sign. Got little moving dots. I got little moving dots. Let's see. Yeah. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Let's slurp that in. Uh, as a, import as a Fusion 360 archive. Huh. What's a Fusion 360 archive? Like, is it just going to import it as a, as a component? Oops, those are all my email addresses. 
I'm gonna do this over here. Send. I'll see if that comes through. Um, in the meantime, I can think about uh, these here switches. It's an, again, it says it's an archive of a Fusion 360 something. Oh, great. Match. I, I would never have guessed. Um, am I looking at the right thing? No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to take a little. So I I now have a bergillion of these little tiny. Ooh, it's toasty. Um, double pull, double throw, um, two position toggle switches that I bought at Swap Meet for nothing um, and are I think are nice. Um, even when I'm using doing single pull, single throw stuff, just having a standard uh, switch is kind of nice. They're, like, tall. They're... Uh, they're small, they're not super protrudy, but they're they're toggles and they're easy to do. Um, and those have a thread diameter of 4.75 millimeters, which would be great. And those have a depth of... Basically 5.5 millimeters. Great. Are those through-hole toggle switches? Yeah, they're through-hole toggle switches. But I'm leaving them. They don't even have solder tabs. Just leave them hanging in space. It's going to be great. Uh, all right. So we'll do. So because of how things are laid out, all the pads are over here. So I've got power. I've got primary, primary 12 volts, power switch, uh, alternate power switch, secondary power pole. So I think I'm going to do power pole, switch, switch, power pole. Solder eyelets for pedal mount for life. Uh huh. Ooh, oh, where? Uh, where's my? Where's my drawing gone? Uh, let's see. Can I? Um. Let's see. There we go. That find in window feature. It's a good one. Um, all right, and now I want to home my view. Home, great. Yeah, if if, the, if these had switches had solder eyelets, I would be oh so happy. But you know, when they were five cents a piece for a tiny double throw, double throw switch, it like I can't be, I can't be too sad. Okay, so let's do our projections again. Got that. I've got my posts on the side here, so we're only using the available space. Great. And the tops of my PCB. Okay. So, we'll look at the right side one more time. So, the switches are going to be the easy part. It's the power poles that are going to be more interesting. Um, so actually, I'm going to take a quick second to see if, yeah, that powerful file came through. That's super cool. Um, I'm going to jump and do the power pole one, because like I say, I probably have oh 50 minutes left um and it'd be cool to get this power poles integrated into this model beforehand um the fusion 360 blog actually did a super cool feature on um uh faking wiring in your um in your fusion 360 models basically like extruding a little circle over a path Are you looking at the right thing yeah great um uh which would be fun to do for aesthetic purposes. I'm not going to try and do it tonight because I can't quite remember what the workflow is. Um, but I could at least put the power poles in here, and that would be super classy. Um, all right, file downloaded. So let's save one more time. I'm actually pretty happy. I'm running Fusion, Eagle, uh, OBS, VLC through OBS, and like 20 Chrome tabs, and the computer is doing all right. So. But I am just going to try and remember to save as often as I can. Uh, all right, so let's make let's make the power poles their own component. Oh, I guess I should probably don't need to because when I import them, they're going to show up as uh, as a as a component themselves. But this should be fine. Um, I would like to. 
Uh, what's going to be the best way to insert these, I wonder? Because I could have downloaded them as a mesh and imported them as a mesh, but if they're, if they're a, a Fusion archive that I want to include... Do I wish want to drop it into my? Let's, oh, let's go find it. This is good. We're we're learning as we go. What was that file called? That file was called Power Pole Connector. Ah, good. Really thinking ahead. All right. So Power Pole. Sorry, do things off screen so you're not seeing uh, all of my shenanigans. Can I just drop that in? Just click and drag. Gonna let me just click and drag there, Fusion. Just a little, uh, just a little click and draggy. No, not so much. Uh, well. Uh. OBJ, DXF. Yeah, manufacturer parts. Seventy five amp connectors. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll do seventy five amps at twelve volts. So, the, yeah, so this is my, welcome to my kilowatt amplifier project. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, we fit a kilowatt amplifier into a thing uh, the size of a pack of tarot cards. Um, I am at a loss. Let's see. Fusion archives. Like, would it be better to just dump? It just, it seems like if it's already included as a fusion document, like, uh, why, why would I want to download it as a mesh? Uh, here we go. How to insert locally saved files into a Fusion 360. That's all I wanted to know, Autodesk. Thank you so much. Um, do, do, do some assemblies as. Hmm. This is, and now you're seeing internet on internet, which is kind of fancy. Uh, well, locally saved files. Design locally saved file to the Fusion 360 data panel. Insert the upload design as you see those things. Yeah, I'd like to just stick it in the data panel. That's all I want. Uh-huh. Data panel, upload. Great. Data panel, upload. Well, that was easy. Very cool. Yeah, it says my bench power supply at work is one kilowatt, 130 amps, one seven point five volts. We could do it, could. But once again, Kenneth, you're kind of towing the line between could and should. Uh, what? What was this file called? Oh, there it's power pole connector. Upload. Mm, but I oh. Mm. I upload it into my gear project? That's silly. Let's upload it here. Change location, gear bank amplifier, select. Upload. Job status. Very exciting. Mm. I do not, not teasers, cause like, you know, there's not enough projects in the world already, but there is a super, I'm super curious about um, this RF part that keeps popping up on Mouser. So for those not in RFville, um, the sort of the uh, you know a kilowatt of RF power probably costs. It, I, I'm, and to be fair, I'm speaking specifically about ham radio, like amateur rated power, probably costs in the neighborhood of like a grand, twelve hundred dollars. Uh, used lightly used. Um, you know the nicer kilowatt and a half amps, which is like legal limit power. It probably you know in the fifteen hundred to three or 4,000 and up range. And a lot of them are tube based, um, like vacuum tube based. Um, so that's just kind of like the going rate for a kilowatt of power. Um, and even if you were going to home make one, um, like probably the, the actual 
um, FETs themselves, your Power RF parts, if you're doing a solid state design, are like $130 a piece, and you're probably talking two or four of those for a kilowatt output. Um, there are kilowatt rated RF transistor kilowatt FETs on Mouser for $30 um, in single unit cost, and I'm sure there's a catch, right? But I can't quite put my finger on on what it is, and right, and there's all kinds of um, you know design considerations for that much RF power. Like you need a lot of cooling, like a big copper heat spreader, and probably active cooling. Um, some people do uh, water cooling on top of that, um, so it's it's non-trivial still. But I'm just trying to figure out what are these. Um, like what are these parts um, that are like what? Why are why are they why do they cost so much less? Uh, Kenneth wants to know the part number. Kenneth, I'm gonna uh, give me one second. I'm gonna try and do two things at once. Here we go. Power pole connector. Get in there. Do do do. While that's uploading, let's see if I can pull. I had this part number saved for just such an occasion. You know, and like the, there are, they definitely have limitations um, as far as bandwidth, um, but like up to 30 or 50 megahertz, clearly. Uh, here we go. Uh, da, da, da. Can I drop a link in chat? Am I cool enough to drop a link in chat? I hope so. Uh, let's see, what's the best way to link this share oh man oh mouser ah uh, why mouser maybe i can just drop the part number in chat and you can all go find it for yourselves uh here we go i mean yeah Kent, it's definitely meant for um for ISM work, right? Like it's, uh, you know, all the reference examples are like a 13.56 megahertz generator. There is your example part number. So Ixis is your your part line, um, your manufacturing line that you're gonna wanna look at. All right, all right, all right, all right, here we go. Back to power poles. So. Slurp this over here. Slurp it over there. Ooh, come back. I run away. I run away. Power poles. Get over there. Okay. Yeah. So this is going to be the thing. Is like where, I, you know, did I make this box deep enough to accommodate? Uh, this power pole connection. I think I did. I think I did all right. Um, but we'll have to see. I think that's, uh, let's see, is this right side up? Uh, that's good enough. Because ultimately I'm gonna need some kind of additional, I think I'm gonna do some kind of additional reinforcement behind these power poles just for, to make sure that they are uh, secure. Um, all right, move copy. Uh, components, this one. Yeah, here, we'll do that nice point-to-point -point copy again, see if it works better this time. So I'm gonna take, uh, ooh, chuck a luggin. I'm gonna take this corner point, if it'll let me, come on, come on. Oh, I should turn off, turn off that PCB. Uh, rendering that PCB is causing it to chug. All right, and then we'll pick the corner point in here that it would mate with. We'll do create copy and we'll say, okay. Yeah, look at that. Ah, some sort of flush mount is needed for the power pole. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about like what, what exactly that looks like for this kind of box. That's probably deeper than we'll get tonight, honestly. Um, but that's okay. All right, so now I'm gonna construct a plane at angle through the midpoint of my back wall here at angle zero, yep. And then I'm going to mirror these power poles across, oops, components, 
one, two. We'll mirror them across that center back face so that they're symmetrical. Like I'm, I'm not entirely settled on this as the location of those power poles, but now at least they'll be symmetrical. All right, let's save one more time. Power pole shaped hole in a lot of hot snot. Yeah, it could do. I mean, that's what I that's what I did for like the last three projects. Um, but it seems like if I'm gonna 3D print the darn thing, like there might be a mo better way. Like maybe it's some kind of flange. You know, even it, honestly, even if it was just like additional flanging to help the hot glue take, like would probably be helpful. Uh, all right. Well, there's that. And then let's see. Let's take a look. One more look at this with the PCB. And see how we feel. Yeah, so it's going to be a little weird to route power from those two pads over to this power pole, but given that it's going to be probably, I mean, I could do it with bell wire. I might use zip. I probably will use, uh, we'll see. Um, but I think that'll be okay. And just for the sake of time, your power poles are sideways, kind of says. Oh. Yeah, that's fair. Well, this we can fix. So this is the power of the timeline. So I mean, so for those who haven't played with it before, and lots of you have, uh, this is our timeline within this component. I'm going to roll back that timeline to this first component. Uh, I'm going to move copy this whole component. I am going to rotate it. Uh, oh, I need an axis. Oh, I need an axis. Let's see. Can I free move? Maybe that would be easier around the component. Yeah, around the body center. Great. So. Uh, do that. Okay. I'm going to capture there. And then hopefully. Oh, man. Uh, why didn't it take? So the mirroring clearly is affected. Did this move? Oh, this move and copy didn't inherit that rotation, I guess. Interesting. All right. So we'll do, we'll do one more of those. Uh, we'll do components. This whole component. We will do... Uh, but not around that. Cancel. Move copy. Components. This one. Nope. Nope. Not that. No. Uh, this one. Now, for the first one, it gave me that nice, like, center of mass axis. Oh, maybe it did rotate first. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So when I did a rotate, it asked, it asked me to define an axis, and then when I went back to I went back to free move, and it put the axis right at like the center of mass, essentially, of this power pole, which I don't know if that's always how it works, but capture that, and then we'll roll the timeline forward, and now hopefully those are more better. Okay, last things last, let's put holes in for our switches. Um, and I guess we'll have to make actual holes in this for the power pole. Because right now the power poles are just kind of, you know, fused um, as if there was some kind of teleporter accident uh, into this box. So we'll do, let's see, now was this sketch actually used for something? No, this is the sketch I was going to do. Uh, okay, so this is like, this is the downside of the timeline, right? I made this sketch, which was to represent these holes, before I inserted these power pole bodies into the timeline. Uh, and I can't... I can't move it later in the timeline. Um, that is just, it's its a fixed property of, of the timeline now. I can redefine that sketch plane, which is a pretty powerful tool, but I can't actually move it later. So, um, so I'm gonna make a separate sketch on this plane and we'll do our, all of our uh, do our switch holes and our power pull holes with that. And then we will call it a night. I'm gonna turn off my PCB, so I'm not snapping to that. Um, my, uh, switches were 4.75 millimeters in diameter, so with the tolerancing on my printer, I'm going to go a full 5 millimeters. Um, oops, and I don't want to be constrained to that. No, no, no. What are you? Something on the other side, it seems. Get out of there. No, get out of there. Constraints. No one wants you. We'll put you uh, switches fairly high up. Maybe we'll do them on the center line of these power poles. That'd be tasteful. Uh, we'll do a construction line. Oops. Yeah, we'll do a construction line. We'll make that construction. We will coincide into that circle to the line. And we will mirror 
that circle over the center line, over the center line, please. Not going to do it. What if I project you? Okay. We will mirror that circle over the projected center line. Come on. There we go. Boom. Those are a little snug, so let's space those out a little bit. Let's give that a dimension. Oh, adding a dimension will over constraint. No, that's not what I want. I want this. Uh, we will call that 8.5 millimeters. And those are mirrored, so that's all defined. The ambient. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the ambient power of that mouse is 5 watts. Yeah, it is. it is. It, it, you, there is no non-heat sink option for them. Absolutely not. Um, but if you look at, like, the um, reference design for that FET or that family of FETs on the XS website, um, it is not unreasonable, right? It's a copper heat spreader um, and a big choke for power input, and they have their own language of driver ICs, so that's what they mostly use. But it's it's not anything crazy, and I, it probably is classy because there's a big fat tank on it. Um, but there you go. Travis says, we just glue those power poles in place? Oh, yeah, Travis, we were just talking about this. I, I don't know yet. Um, I, I, I would like to do something fancier than that. Um, I think that is probably not something I will get into tonight just for the sake of time. Uh, but it would be cool. Like, I think, you know, there is probably something to be said for... Um, with the tolerancing on my printer, like I probably something mating with the actual power pole flanges is not necessarily in the cards. Like it's just, I think a little bit too tight. Um, but I could do like a flange around the back here that was had some extra support um, and then just glue them in. Um, so there are some options. I'm, I'm for tonight, I'm just gonna punch a hole as if I was gonna glue them. Um, and we'll come back to this another day, I think. Uh, all right, so, oh, hang on. One more thing I want to do in this sketch. So I've just, I've projected just those power poles onto there. Um, so now I'm just going to draw a hole. Because so the, the offset command in Fusion, at least currently, is just a little bit sketchy. Like, it doesn't necessarily like to work with um, single segment lines chained together. Wow, that was an exciting little, uh, little Fusion whoopsie doodle there. Um, so I'm going to just draw a rectangle across all of this, and then hopefully it will offset that rectangle. Mm -hmm. Didn't really like that. Let's see if, uh, let's see. So let's just give it a shot. Um, cause you can offset single lines or you can offset closed curves, but it's not always happy about offsetting a closed curve made of single lines. Yeah, see, so when I select it there, it wants to um, uh, select a rectangle instead of the selection of curves that was the power poles. It's also struggling with offsetting to the outside. Oh, right, because it's offset. Yeah, okay, so I'll do this the old-fashioned way. Like a bunch of, like, might as well get out my slide rule. Um, so tolerancing on my printer for an interior hole like this, uh, probably I'm going to go uh, down to 0.3, I would say. Um, that's probably even just a little bit tight, um, but then I can always file back a little bit if I need to. That's This is something that really should be um, a parameter. But like I say, I'm right at the end of my night here. Um, so this will this will do. We're gonna come back to this sketch at some point anyway and figure out figure out how do you mount power poles in the box. That should really just have been the title the title of this stream was power poles in a box. Take, that's your dimension. That's all you wanted was to have a dimension, right? Just be that dimension. There you go. Oh yeah. Do that. 
Uh, let's sort of contain that. Good. Why? 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 Fusion get a little a little grumperoo on me here. Like why won't it won't let me reference that dimension now? So we're just gonna get we're gonna get all sloppy on it at the end of our night here. Oh, it's gonna be fine. Okay. Stop sketch. Um. Ever thought of making a tolerance parameter? Yeah, it's true, Chris. Yeah, no, I I absolutely need a tolerance parameter, and this would be the perfect the perfect situation for it. Travis says, very interesting fusion chat more at some point. Yeah, Travis, I would love to chat fusion with you at any point. Um, because it's super cool. Like the honestly, the work that Lee and Travis did in Vectorworks was like it's super crisp, it's super awesome. Um, and for the kind of mechanical designs that it was doing, like makes all the sense in the world. Um, I think there are some some cool potentials about about fusion that are worth worth looking at for sure. Um, but yeah, have a good night, Travis. I will see you uh see you around. All right, so now let's do this cut. Why are you being so grumpy? Oh, was I in the oh, was that sketch in this component? Oh, it's gonna be so bummer. No, 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 we're good. Okay. Oof, I don't know why it's being so, so grumpy about selecting this, this face. Do I have additional sketches on? Like what is, what is happening? Maybe, there we go. Yeah, I had an additional, I had an additional sketch that was preventing me from selecting the faces in this sketch. All right, so we'll do those. We'll do our holes for our switches. And we will do those to the inside face. Cut them. Call it good. Yeah, Chris, you're exactly right. Like, tolerancing all of this would be really good. And actually, I realized I didn't tolerance um, the BNC connectors at all, um, which is not super great. Uh... Yeah, that's not super great. Um, but I'm going to do it the lazy man's way, and we can always file back if we need to. What I mostly have found is that the tolerancing, right, because I'm, I'm printing pretty much entirely in PLA these days uh, with some PETG, and I would actually, I would love to do this one um, finally in PETG um, just for strength reasons. Um, so you don't have to worry about shrinking at all, um, but the tolerancing is, is different based on whether I'm considering an interior hole or an exterior feature or an exterior fit. Um, so like dimensionally, like I'm not worried about the dimensionality between these posts being wrong, but like sometimes it is nice to just hand dimension something like a power pull cutout or a switch cutout just for the sake of like understanding how my printer works and how it does dimensionality. Um, so yo, so you're exactly right. Um, but, but <laughs> I'm still gonna do it my way, I guess. <laughs> um, let's unbone that. Yeah. Okay, I think this is, what's your go-to for that value? Um, so on my printer, um, if I have a, a non-3D printed part that's fitting into an interior hole, um, like if I have a, a piece of like brass rod that's going into a hole, I will do 0.3 millimeters all the way around for uh, an okay fit. For a tight fit, I'll do 0.2. Um, or 0.15, and now I have to file back a little bit. Um, and then for a lot of other stuff, I just do it um, sort of empirically. Like I'm work I was working on a, a model fly rail for a while, um, and that has so many like peg and post connections that I just printed a bunch of samples um, in the in the dimensionality that I was looking for and just test fit it. And that ended up being about about 0.2, um, but that's just sort of how it worked out. Um, cool. Well. That's gonna be pretty much it. Let's give this guy a little paint job, and then uh, and then we'll call it a night. Um, I am going to do 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 because I'm going to ultimately print these in black PLA. Ooh, we're chugging lugging. We'll just come over here to plastic. Uh, we'll do these in uh, like a black opaque black box top we'll do in opaque black let's go back and select our full yeah so here is the product of uh ooh, maybe i could even okay wait one more thing one more thing um 
let us find, I guess I can make a custom one, but just because I'm lazy. Ooh, no, come on, come on. Uh, can I, can I not apply a material to a component that you have created? Well, maybe I have to unlink it. That would be fine. Cause I'm not gonna change that model too much. Uh, let's unlink this break link. Ooh, thinking about it. This is the other curse of that timeline is it has to recon like if you make a significant change in the middle, it has to rebuild the timeline. So just gonna see if I could make the appropriate power poles red, just cause why not? Oh, nope, not that one. Ah, it's the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer in radio. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be the wrong answer in um, in other contexts because um, RC4's DMX, uh, their, their uh, 50 amp dimmers um, chose to have a different standard power pole arrangement than ham radio. Um, so since this is a ham radio one, we'll do red on the right. Um, the RC4 standard is different, I believe. Okay, one more time. We'll go back out. We'll go back out and we'll appreciate everything we've done this evening. Ooh, I made the box red. Uh, well, that's kind of classy. We'll just keep that. We'll say it's a red box. Uh, no, it's gonna make it crazy. One more time. Black. All right. So here is the fruit of tonight's labor. Um, we imported our PCB from Eagle, directly into Fusion 360. Uh, which went pretty well, all things considered. Like I, I'm sort of impressed at how at how smooth that was. Um, we built up our uh, standoffs underneath. We cut out a hole in the bottom for those fets to poke through onto a, a heat sink. Um, we built up some posts in the corner so that we could attach our lid. Um, we built up our lid and we imported uh, our screws uh, from McMaster Car. Where did those go? There we go. Yeah, we spent so much time trying to get them in here and aligned. Might as well put them in. Yeah, so we put our screws in from a master car. We cut out some holes in the front for some BNC connectors and some LEDs and some holes in the back for some power poles and some switches uh, with uh, Chris Wick's power pole model, which is super cool. So that is where uh, I'm going to end it for tonight. Uh, obviously, there's a few more things to do. We still got to figure out what we're going to do um, about heat sinking on the bottom. Um, we could use some decoration up top. Um, you know, we could think more about uh, uh, tolerancing after we do our first test print, um, which would be super cool. Um, and obviously, we still have to experiment with slurping values back and forth between different PCBs and Eagle to see if that really is as smooth as we think it is. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'm just going to say thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, thanks to, to Kenneth and Chris and Aaron, Travis, uh, and whoever else I missed. This has been super fun. Um, we'll probably continue to do some... Uh, Fusion 360 live streams. Uh, the Tiny Moving Light project is gaining steam again. I have a couple more updates I want to do to that, especially now that we have um, the uh, Arduino talking to ACN. I think there's some really good possibilities there. Um, and maybe we'll come back and do a, a, a version 2 of this stream when we have version 2 of the PCB. And obviously I'll have to share um, when this project is actually completed and uh, we've got everything actually in a box and we can sort of compare how this um, compared to uh, our final our final version. Uh, but in any case, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a real great time hanging out with y'all, doing a little stream. Uh, and I will catch you on the next one. Cool. Good night, y'all.